Okay, Mr. Marshall, you have a quorum of the board. It is 6.37 by my clock. Amherst Media is with us here. Um, the attendees are coming on in. I think you're good to go. Okay, thank you, Pam. You're welcome. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of November 20th, 2024. My name is Doug Marshall and as chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 6.37 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. <clears throat> Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is accessible on the meeting agenda, posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda where the Zoom link is listed at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the town's website. Board members, I'll take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively and return to mute. Bruce Colden. I am here. Uh, Fred Hartman. Hartwell is here. I'm sorry, sorry, Fred. Uh, Lawrence Klotz. I am here. Jesse Major. Present. I, Doug Marshall, am present. Johanna Newman has notified us she will be arriving late and I do not see her yet. And Karin Winter. Here. Thank you all. Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment, and I will call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. To the general public, the general public comment item is reserved for public comment regarding items not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment may also be heard at other times during the meeting when deemed appropriate by the planning board chair. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished. When finished speaking, residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation may be disconnected from the meeting. Okay, time is 640 and we'll go on to our first item, which is the minutes. Uh, the uh, minutes of October 16th uh, were, were circulated by Pam early this week, I believe, um, maybe Monday. So uh, I hope you all had a chance to look at it. And um, does anybody have any comments? Or does anybody, let's, let's just ask for comments first and then we'll go to the motion. All right, I'm not seeing anybody who wants to make any comments. Bruce? Um, the comment maybe, uh, since I was away, not for the meeting, it would happen just before I left, but I did gather that there was a fair amount of conversation probably arising from uh, Ken's comments and so forth. And there was a concern, as I recall, 
that um, we may have overstepped the mark in creating something of a precedent for uh, dormitories in zones that they hadn't been intended. Now, I read through the minutes and didn't see um, anything that specifically indicated that we had done that, neither did I see in our findings specifically that we were aware that we may have inadvertently been doing it. So I think the minutes are fine. But since I haven't been privy to that, I just want to make sure that we're reviewing these minutes with a view to subsequent, uh, not that we can change them, but we want to make sure that in certain aspects, I think that we are very clear about what these minutes uh, say. Uh, in other words, the base is this is the base uh, report or re record of uh, what might be future conversation. So I just, uh, I couldn't see anything that would cause me to uh, um, seek to uh, adjust anything. Um, that's just me. Okay. Uh, I see Lawrence, and then we'll be able to Jesse. Yeah, as uh, I'm, I'm going to recuse myself from this part of the discussion. Okay. Thank you, um, Jesse. I guess just responding to Bruce, I also think the minutes are fine. My recollection is that this does not meet the definition of dormitory. So there was not that, yes, that discussion point was raised, but I thought that's where we ended was that no, this was, this project was not, did not fall on that definition. So we were not changing anything. Yeah. Um, I guess I'll let Nate go. And then I, if he doesn't, I will, I will give you my summary of subsequent conversations about this topic. Yeah. I was going to say, or we just don't talk about it because it's not on the agenda and, you know, it's not something we need to start deliberating now for this project. So, you know, if, I think if we have comments to the minutes, I'll just keep it there. And if we want to talk about it at a future meeting, we would have it as an agenda topic. Uh, but, you know, I think the board discussed it at two meetings and covered it, uh, Bruce. So, you know, if you look at the minutes and the board votes them and thinks they're accurate, the videos will also be posted online of those meetings if you'd want to watch, but I don't, I would recommend not having another discussion about it. Okay, thanks, Nate. Yeah, I was just going to say we did talk about it at two the two subsequent meetings, uh, pretty reasonably extensively. So, um, maybe if you can find the recordings and uh, you'll see the minutes when those come out for those meetings. Uh, but we probably have a little bit, at least a little bit, of unfinished business about this topic. Jesse? I was going to move to approve the minutes. OK. Uh, did you move? Yes, I moved to approve the minutes. Thank you. Uh, Bruce? Second. Thank you both. Uh, any, any further comment? Anyone? OK, we'll go ahead with a, with a, with a roll call vote, starting with you, Bruce. I approve. Fred. Aye. Laura, or Lawrence is recusing himself. Uh, Jesse. Aye. Um, and Karen. Aye. And I'm an I as well. And so that's five in favor, uh, one recusal, and one absence. All right. Time now is 6.45. Next item on our agenda is public comment. So I will read the names of the attendees as they've, they've arrived at this point in the meeting. And then while I do that, if you are a member of the public and would like to make a comment at this time about something that does not appear later in tonight's agenda, this is the time to do it. So uh, Barbara Roberts, uh, B. Jemison, Christine Brestrup, Sid Champeau, Alyssa Rubenstein, Jonathan Slater, Judy Pozar, Kyle, Louise C., Rob, and Walker. Those are the names I see among the 10 attendees at this point in the meeting. So I don't yet see any hands from anyone on that list who is interested in making a comment at this time. I will 
we'll give you a minute to think it over and then we'll move on. Okay, all right, we'll move on to our next item, item three on the agenda under old business. This is site plan, it's regarding site plan review 2023-01. The applicant was or is Archipelago Investments LLC located at 46, 47 Olympia Drive or 47 Mather Drive. This is a review of the conditions of the site plan approval prior to issuance of a building permit. We're gonna review chap condition 13 regarding the submittal of a landscape plan showing quantities of specific plants for review and approval prior to the issuance of a building permit. And conditions 28 and 29 regarding the submittal of a photometric plan, excuse me, for the site, as well as catalog cuts of the exterior lighting fixtures for review and approval prior to the issuance of a building permit. Um, Fred, I see your hand. What would you like to say? Um, I will be abstaining from this. Uh, this uh, public hearing uh, and action took place before I assumed membership on the board. And so I have no basis for uh, acting uh, at this time. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm not sure you actually have to do that. Um, um, I might, Nate, I might want you to, to weigh in on that. Yeah, no, I agree with Doug's um, assumption that, you know, this is a public meeting and as part of the conditions, it was the applicant would uh, come back to the planning board at a public meeting and present you know, a few items, landscape plan and lighting plan to confirm that they're sufficient so that a building permit could be issued. So it's not as if the hearing is reopened or, um, you know, we're taking on new evidence um, in terms of like a hearing format. So it's really just to satisfy the conditions as the board laid out. So Nate, um you don't expect that we need to vote on this tonight. We simply need to receive this additional information. Uh, no, I, I um, no, the board could take a vote, but I'm not saying it's not, I'm not, you're not, I'm not saying you're going to reopen the hearing, right? You're, you can vote to say that the conditions are satisfied is what I, you know, how I would vote, not that we're reopening the hearing for the site plan review, just that those conditions are satisfied. So a building permit could be issued. Okay. Fred, your hand is still up. Uh, I just raised it again. Uh, based on that analysis, I will participate. Okay. Well, I, I hope you had a chance and took the time to look at this material before the meeting, um, as well as the other folks who may have thought they were not eligible to participate. All right, um, Pam. Uh, do we, it uh, looks like we have Kyle Wilson here from Archipelago. <clears throat> Welcome, Kyle. Good evening. How are you guys doing? <laughs> We're doing well. Um, maybe you could uh, go through the, the, the material you're, you're submitting this evening. Sure. I'll uh, share a screen. Uh, thanks for having us. Uh, we're excited to be at a position where we've applied for the building permit for 47 Olympia. It's a project next to 57 Olympia, which we opened in 2016. And you can see just north of the uh, project here. Uh, this is the landscape plan that we have to submit uh, as part of the building permit process. Uh, and we've also got a photometric plan. Uh, the element of the landscape plan that we did not have when we got this building approved was the number the quantity of plants uh, for each plant species specified. So this is a 
plan that the landscape architect did uh, that showed a quantity of every plant. Um, and you can see that in this column here. Uh, no other changes, just uh, simply uh, a graphic representation of every, every plant, their quantity and their size. Okay. Um, what about the photometric and light fixture information? I can do that as well. The photometric plan is a great number of ones and zeros um, as shown here. Um, the, uh, there are, the entrance to the building is through the courtyard. The main entrance is, is here. Uh, there's a service drive on the south side. Um, and the lighting in the courtyard is a series of bollards. And there's two different bollards and the cut sheets I can show you as well. Uh, Bega is the manufacturer. There's a directional 180 and then there's a full 360. Um, the three light fixtures on the south side for the drive aisle are uh, directional wall lights. Um, there's, a, there's a single uh, in, uh, in uh, concrete um, uh, floor light, as it were, uh, that, is, that is right in the middle of this to kind of give some lighting in a place that could not be lit well by the bollards. And then we've got the same light fixtures that we have installed uh, just north of here at uh, 57 Olympia uh, shown along the sidewalk. There's one here, there's one here, and there's one here. Um, the light, uh, uh, none of the, uh, I think we've also got some bollards up along the bike path that are here. There's four bollards to uh, light the, the bike area that are on the north of the building. Um, and I think all of the, we can zoom into the photometrics, but uh, they vary obviously based on location relative to the bollards. Uh, we worked to make sure that we didn't have any spillage. We were able to light the service area adequately and keep it safe, but also prevent uh, light from going over the property line on the south. Um, and as far as photometric plans go, they tend not to be the most exciting. Um, and the light fixtures are pretty straightforward. I wanted to also show you a shot of where the site is for Google Maps. Um, this is the existing, uh, was the existing sorority. Uh, this is our 57 Olympia project. This is the uh, fixture that we've installed next door that we would install uh, three of those along the front here. The service drive is approximately where the existing service drive was. Uh, there remains an uh, existing street light that um, ties back. You can see the shadow of the, the wire here on Mather uh, that will remain, and we haven't modeled, but uh, that will be a, in addition to the light as we've shown. All right. It's uh, pretty straightforward. I just We didn't have that information at the time when we submitted and um, have subsequently put that together. So my... My packet, uh, as was mailed to me, had uh, cuts of each of the light fixtures. Um, in addition to the small images you showed us, uh, yep. so if we want to see the individual light fixture cuts, you have those available too. I do. I can pull okay. those up. All right. Well, let's see if anybody wants to see those. I, All right, I'll board show you. members. Uh, any any questions or comments about the the uh, landscape plan, including the quantities of, of plants and the uh, light, site lighting information. Bruce. Um, I think I'm, I'm going to pass on quantities of plants. I'm going to assume that uh, since the, the numbers seem to be large, particularly the Pachysandra, that uh, if the Pachysandra is any indication, I think we're probably fine. Plants tend to grow, and often there's more plants than you need rather than fewer with time. So I'm probably going to be satisfied with the plants. Um, uh, I, I did look at the uh, the photometric uh, benefit of uh, the electronic uh, files these days is you can zoom in and you can really see all of these little numbers and so forth around. So it, it seemed to me to be um, uh, pretty satisfactory. And uh, as Kyle said, the spread at the edges seems to be zero, at least according to the photometric results. Um, the um, 
fixtures I I thought seemed to be um, appropriate, and and I didn't realize that they were a continuation, at least on the pole, uh, fixtures are con uh, concerned of what's next door, which seems to be a a, a nice thing to do. Um, I only had one question, uh, Kyle, and that is in the courtyard you've got uh, some bollards that are labeled T E, um, but you also got T and T ones, and they in the uh, so I guess I just want to be assured that they're more or less the same as the uh, as the fixture cuts, and that uh, uh, the, and there's, there's there's not a fixture that uh, you're intending to use that you haven't shown us. No, they they are all either the 180 uh, uh, view of the bollard or the full 360. Okay, I'm uh, I'm satisfied. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Karen? Yeah, I don't know if this fits in the discussion at all, but I thought I would bring it out. Um, so why, it, it, when you when you do a project like this with lighting and everything, is there ever a consideration to just bring the wires underground? Uh, because I don't know, we're so behind the times in having so much ugly wiring above, and it just seems that new buildings, there should be an effort to get the electricity or is that not in in your power all of the power for the building will be is underground will come out of a new transformer that will go here in this location so all of these any of the lighting that we're installing will will have all wiring underground the existing street lights that are outside of our purview um uh we we have no control over Okay, that's good to hear that all that everything you're doing is underground. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, anybody else? Any other? Any other comments or questions? Uh, I guess I'll open it up to the public. Are there any comments about this this information about this project uh, that anybody would like to comment on from the public? Okay, so in that case, I guess we need a motion to accept this additional material. Uh, and uh, I don't know, Nate, do we need to say that we we are we accept it and therefore do we need to mention that now the building permit can be issued or not? Yeah, so the uh, decision says for review and approval. So you could say, you know, was accepted and approved. Okay. To satisfy the conditions. Okay. Uh, Bruce? I was going to make the motion to approve. I was thinking that it would be approve the conditions of the specific, uh, sorry, the, the provisions of the specific conditions. Um, there were two conditions, I think, or that, that said that we needed to um, mm -hmm. see and approve. So I would say that uh, move that we accept the submitted uh, material as uh, uh, satisfactory and and sufficient to uh, um, uh, validate the satisfaction of uh, conditions X and Y. It'd be conditions 13, 28, and 29. Yeah, that's the motion. Okay. Um, I think you could make it a little more concise when you actually write it down, Pam. <laughs> I'll do my best. <laughs> Jesse. I'll second that motion. Okay. All right. Anybody? One last chance for additional comments. Any hands? No. All right. All right. Uh, Bruce, we'll start with you again. Hi. Um, approval. A uh, yes is to approve the material as satisfying the conditions. Yes. And Fred. Aye. Lawrence. Aye. Uh, Jesse. Aye. Karen. Aye. And I'm an aye as well. That's six in favor, one absence. Thank you very much, Kyle. Thank you for your time tonight. Good luck with your meeting. All right. All right, uh, time is 7.01.
We can now move on to the fourth item on the agenda. Not quite. We, yeah. need four, we need four oh, more I minutes. Got, I got four minutes to kill. Mm -hmm. Well, Jesse can get some dinner, maybe. Um, you had a part B under old business. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Topics not reasonably anticipated. Anything there? No. no. OK. How about uh, new business? Are we going to have any topics not? Anticipated under new business? I am not, Nate. Are you? No. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll ask a couple more, hopefully, simple questions before we hit 705. Um, Form A, A and R subdivision applications. Anything coming our way? Um, no. Yeah. Oh, we have the preliminary subdivision hearing on December 4th for, you know, you, you drive in Amity Street, 422 Amity Street. But other than that, I'm not aware of anything. Okay. Uh, Karen. Um, if we have some time, I want to discuss at some point the, uh, and Nate, I don't know if we have any power about this at all, the parking by the, uh, by the playground somehow there should be probably time meters there because right now families that come with their kids to play can't find parking because it's, you know, other park that should be discussed. I don't know if by the planning board or there's something wrong there. It has to be rethought. Well, would that be something that maybe a car and an email to Guilford would be in order? Would he be the right person to talk to, Nate? Yes. Yeah. You can copy myself and Okay. Okay, thanks. Yeah, we don't get into meters very often. Yeah, no, no. But, I just wanted to know how to do it. Karen, yeah. we, no, it, it's, it's, I mean, every time I come into work, I look, I go by there. I've gone by there the last few days. I'm amazed. It's parked up in the morning too. It's just really no spots. Right. It's, it's not, the parking isn't there for the families for the playground. <laughs> All right. Now I know All how right. to do it. Thanks. Karen, I'm we, glad you raised this. We're we're frequent flyers there, and we can never find parking. Right. Uh, Karen, are you are you referring to Kendrick Park? Yes. Okay. And that could be, you know, I mean, the planning board. This could be a the planning board wanted this to be an agenda item at a future meeting. It could be something we discuss more um, in general, you know, about you know parking for kind of some of these amenities downtown. Karen, yeah, Karen, would you want to do that? Sure. All right. Uh, Karen, I'm going to move on to Jesse. Is that all right? Yeah, yes. Sorry. Okay. Jesse. On a very much related, really just questioning, um, who, who's the right, who, who issues permits for the food trucks, for example, at Kendrick Park? I just have no idea. And who to contact <clears throat> about that? And maybe that could be part of our discussion as well, if it's within our purview. And Lawrence, sure. you can come to my house when you go to the playground. There's um, the Board of License Commissioners uh, and Town Council. So there's a few different, you know, reviews for, for food trucks. And, you know, there's also then inspections of the food truck themselves. But in terms of where they're located, uh, there's, you know, probably two different uh, so who wants, groups. That... Who wants comments about it is the real question. <laughs> sure. Send them to me and I'll forward them around. Okay. Deal. All right, well, we successfully filled our four minutes. Uh, and I guess we got, we, maybe we got through new business, mm -hmm. unanticipated. Um, all right, so we'll come back to those I, the later items there. All right, the time is 7.05 and we're gonna re reopen a public hearing. In accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law, Chapter 40A, this public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard. Regarding University Drive Overlay District, continued from October 30th, 2024, to consider amending the zoning bylaw by adopting the University Drive Overlay District as Article 17 
and amending the official zoning map by adding the University Drive Overlay District. The Overlay District would include properties on the east and west sides of University Drive between Northampton Road and Amity Street and establishes its own requirements for only mixed use buildings, including dimensional standards, standards and conditions, and design guidelines. Is there any board member disclosure? I do not see any. Um, do we need, do we have an applicant presentation, Nate, or do we just go right back into our conversation? Um, you know, I could walk through it again. I mean, there hasn't, you know, so Nate Malloy, a planner with the town, uh, I'll share my screen in a minute. There haven't been any changes. So what was presented previously and then presented, you know, initially to town council and then what the planning board discussed a few weeks ago hasn't changed. You know, there have been public comments submitted with concerns about, um, you know, the big Y Plaza and other businesses and what the impact could be from the overlay. Uh, there are concerns about wetlands and stormwater. And so, you know, there have been comments submitted. There's some in the packet. Uh, we've tried to upload them as they come in and make them available. Uh, you know, and, um, you know, but in terms of, you know, anything now is, you know, it's kind of up for the discussion of the board, right? So if we want to, um, that the purpose of the hearings is for the board to take public comment and then discuss amongst yourselves, how would you recommend this to town council? So, you know, we have a zoning amendment proposal and a map and would you want to make changes, no changes? Do, would you not want to recommend it? You know, you can discuss it, you know, over a number of hearings. And so this is the second hearing for it. Um, as was mentioned earlier, I would recommend continuing this to December 4th. The CRC won't really discuss it until December 3rd. And so it would be helpful. I mean, it could be helpful for the board to keep the hearing open to see what discussion is generated at the CRC hearing. Um, and so, you know, I'll just share my screen quickly and just show the boundary of it. And I can just um, talk about it a little bit. And so as Doug mentioned in the description, uh, you know, it's from Amity Street south to Northampton Road uh, on either side of University Drive. And so this, you know, the black line is the boundary. It applies to mixed use buildings only. So, you know, as an overlay, all the base zoning remains. So there's limited business, office park, and an R&D overlay. Uh, it has its own dimensional standards. And so, you know, it allows for multi-unit uh, buildings with the requirement for mixed use. Uh, and there's, you know, different setbacks. So the, the west side, the access drive could become a pedestrian way. Uh, we have some architectural standards. Uh, and then, you know, it um, has flexible parking. And so, you know, like I said, none of that has changed. And so if we wanted to discuss it, we could. Um, and then here's, you know, the big Y property, which is in Amherst and in Hadley. Uh, and so, you know, I, I know... Uh, the big Y owners themselves have been contacted and they said they're excited by the overlay. The owners of the property um, staff has reached out to and we're hoping to discuss this with them early next week. Uh, big Y doesn't own the property. It's another organization. So um, we're going to talk to them about it. And all property owners were notified when the first hearing was held. So typically we wouldn't send, um, you know, public hearing notices to property owners for a zoning change, but because this is you know, a discrete number, we sent them the map, the memo, and the actual, I think the actual bylaw language and the public hearing notice. Um, maybe it was just a memo and the notice. And then anyhow, the owners were provided a, a mail, a mailed um, public notice. Uh, and, you know, we've ha we had some comments from uh, property at the last one, and I haven't heard from any others in terms of questions or comments, but they were notified of this. Yeah, maybe for... For Bruce's benefit, uh, I'll just mention that the the the, owner, the uh, commenter at the last meeting was was associated with the healthcare facility on the corner uh, at Route Nine and University Drive. Um, he was worried about uh, new development affecting groundwater and um, you know potentially flooding below grade. Uh, spaces at their property, which um, they apparently have already had some issues with. 
Okay, so I see four hands. This is a popular topic tonight. Um, so we'll start with you, Bruce. Um, I just wanted to be sure that it's, you know, that's realized that I wasn't at the previous hearing and, and uh, often that, uh, and I haven't watched the, the I, I didn't think to watch the video of the previous meeting. I probably should have. I don't know why I didn't think to do that. I, but uh, does that affect my ability to participate? Um, I want to make sure that uh, we're all above board here. No. Uh, and if we, you know, continue the hearing to another night, then as long as you, you know, you can get caught up, you still uh, yeah. can vote. I mean, this thing obviously has been going on for a very long time, and all I would have missed was probably some public comment. I think so. It seems to me, since it's not a, um, it's not a hearing with that kind of a decision, that it's a recommendation, that are probably okay. But I just wanted to be sure about that. Yeah, I think you're um, okay tonight. If we were going to vote tonight, it might be an issue. Okay, um, but I'm not even sure of that. Okay, yeah, uh, it's, uh, it's unclear that it actually is an issue. Uh, it's not. You know, it's a different if it were a, um, you know, a regulatory permit or something. Yeah, okay. I have a, a a couple of comments that I could make. One was I was just going to report on the discussion that I had with uh, Mary Jo Haneke. Um, where we spent an hour discussing a specific aspect of this that was a concern of hers, and uh, and and it has it's it's an article. Uh, uh, it's it's seventeen point four one having to do with the frontage and so forth. Uh, but was that uh, did she make a uh, her known and so forth? No, we haven't. I mean, some of the uh, counselors attended uh, one or or the other of our meetings, mm -hmm. but they have not commented. Well, it was an interesting uh, uh, discussion. I think uh, her concern, and she could say it, I suppose, but I thought it was a, a, a probably important. It might be shared by others. Her concern was that the uh, provision, she was concerned that in uh, requiring um, uh, kind of business retail use uh, uh, on, the, on the first floor and along the street front, that this uh, evidence, uh, her evidence is that uh, this will remain empty. Um, she was perhaps thinking forever, but anyway, for a long time, and that... Uh, she just felt that this was not a good idea and that we should uh, uh, question the uh, commitment to retail uh, in that floor. I said, uh, I'm summarizing an hour in, in a minute or so, I said uh, that may be in the short term, but it's the long term. These buildings are going to last way longer than five years if it even takes that long for the vitality to be established. Uh, I think we mutually recognize that it would certainly take some time and it the housing would fill up much fa faster. But my sense is that we still should maintain our commitment to that, uh, uh, the wording of 17.41, um, uh, because ultimately uh, it will gain uh, traction and the vitality will have a chance to grow. And we also have a chance to uh, incentivize perhaps the uh, the various developers who to who who could, if they choose, perhaps uh, take a more proactive stance in trying to find uh, um, uh, um, people to fill those spaces rather than just wait because they wouldn't be driven, perhaps, by uh, strictures of um, income, uh, cash flow, and so forth. Because we imagine that that's going to be taken care of in the stories above. So, uh, just to report that there was a. Uh, a strenuous conversation, interesting and engaged one about that particular issue. I don't think I changed Mandy Jo's mind. Uh, she didn't change mine, but we thought more about each other's position. Okay. Um, I will say that at the town council meeting where that where the where the provision was referred to us, she commented uh, in a similar vein about. Uh, her support that we allow apartment buildings in a, in a portion of this and not require the retail. And also that if we, if we allowed apartment buildings that we still require the first floor, floor to floor height to be sufficient to accommodate uh, commercial space in the future. Um, and so I think she was thinking, why don't we let commercial or residential go into that first floor right off the bat? 
And once, you know, if the commercial market ever re returns in strength, somebody might convert it back or into commercial space. Uh, so just to give yes, some background made, on, on, on your that, position. She made that argument to me too. And my, my response was, well, once you, uh, once you fill it up, it's going to be harder to back mm -hmm. out. And I felt that, uh, uh, that that was not ideal. So, um, okay. All right, Jesse. Thank you. Uh, I think that that topic did come up and I'm definitely in agreement with you on that, Bruce, that, uh, I think we've seen from town certainly as long as I've been here and probably longer than that. Once things become student rentals, they don't come back. Um, so I would support keeping that provision as it is. Um, I was going to, the main comment I wanted to make was that given all the conversation, I would definitely support uh, moving the boundary to not include the big Y plaza. And my main thinking is to just have this move forward, hopefully, uh, and, and see what develops because we could always revisit that section a year, two, three, five years from now to see if we wanted to then include it in the overlay based on how things are being developed on the rest of the, the strip. So, yeah, okay. I would I would propose we move the boundary. That's all. All right. And would you propose moving it uh, north of CVS or yes. up yes. up to CVS? I was thinking north of CVS. And what we do with the first two properties, you know, on the corner, I guess would be excluded now. Also, there's there's possibility to include those, but I would think just move it north, just beyond CVS. Okay. All right, um, Fred. Yeah, um, a question to Nate. I thought, um, I remember this conversation and I, I basically support the intent of it, but um, I thought I recalled that you had a different solution relative to uh, the, the narrative that describes uh, the activity within the first, I think it was 400 feet or whatever is appropriate. Uh, I, I th my impression was you had a different way to accomplish the same objective. And so I'm just wondering where that stands at this point. Sure, yeah, I guess, you know, I made a note to myself to, after I said nothing had changed, I guess, you know, there were things discussed but say that weren't voted on. So one was actually the height of the buildings. Yeah. You know, we after we uh, after this was referred by council staff discussed uh, this with a few developers. And sixty five feet is not enough for the number of floors we want. So it's either we add five more feet or maybe seven to seventy or seventy two, given how the buildings are framed and built now. Uh, what Fred is mentioning, you know, I discussed that within, you know, it could be. 300 feet or whatever, some radius of that Northampton Road University Drive intersection. And it could just be on the west side that, you know, 100%, we could have, you know, different standards and conditions for different parts of this overlay. You know, we had discussed at some point, right, allowing apartments within certain areas or having separation between apartments. So we could say that within a certain side of, um, you know, certain side or distance of the intersection that, you know, I had two ideas. One is that the ground floor be 100% non-residential. Uh, and so that, you know, it can't guarantee that big Y or something won't move, but, you know, it really requires then that, you know, you have sp the whole space would be uh, non-residential use. And the other one is that you, we could also narrow down what non-residential use means in that area. So we could actually then specify certain use classifications in the bylaw whether that's, you know, retail or consumer uses or anything else. And so, you know, there is that flexibility to get more specific uh, in certain areas. Um, you know, I will say that right now on the big Y property, given its size and the zoning, there could be 60 or 70 units constructed and it just, it hasn't happened. Um, you know, maybe the overlay would incentivize um, something because of, you know, the flexibility and um, ability to get more density, but there is, given the size of the parcel, you know, there is, the zoning allows for things to happen all along that stretch of University Drive, right? We, the town implemented the R&D overlay with thoughts that it might encourage something, 
it, it didn't change. Um, you know, we tried looking at rezoning the northern end of this section a few times because uh, it seems like development hasn't, couldn't use the zoning that was in place. And so, you know, I think this is one more, you know, one more look at it. Um, Nate, if you narrowed the residential definition for an area, wouldn't wouldn't the other zoning on this property can work counter against that and and make that kind of a pointless step? No, not not the residential. I meant the non-residential. Oh, so, okay. So if um, um, you know if let's see if this if this works. So you know if you know we could say that I mean, we could just say that in this section of the overlay. 100% of the ground floor has to be non-residential. And we could say, and that non-residential can only be these specific use categories from our bylaw, you know, retail and consumer, consumer uses or, you know, whatever, right? It, and so that way, it, it, you know, right now, the, the way um, it's defined is that, you know, 75% of the facade length to a depth of 24 feet can be any non-residential use. So that could be office, that could be, um, you know, stores, it doesn't have to be, you know, um, you know, so, some things that, you know, it could be anything really um, that's allowed within the zoning here. So whatever is allowed in the base zoning. And so we could be more specific. Okay. All right. Thanks. All right. Um, Jesse. Thanks. I think Lawrence was up first. Well, okay. All right. Lawrence. Yeah, so I, I just I, I have a couple of questions here and and um you know acknowledge that I'm I'm relatively new to all of this. So uh and this is the first time that I'm I'm substantively commenting on the planning board. So if I um uh um am in any way uh asking a foolish question or or speaking out of line, um please bear with me. But um uh, I I read the public comments and and um, really considered them uh, pretty pretty closely here and it seems that a lot of the concern obviously um, as Jesse noted before is is around um, uh, potentially losing the big Y potentially losing CVS potentially losing um, uh, the medical facility across the street um, is there a, and and I I also note that you know Nate mentioned a minute ago that that the big Y owner is excited about the possibility here. Um, I'm I'm intrigued by what Nate said just a second ago about adjustments that we could make to um, uh, the requirements for for just that part of the overlay. Um, do we have any evidence to suggest that that you know an overlay like this would um, increase the likelihood that those um, those businesses would would leave or is is this just um speculation at this point i don't i don't know if that's a well I, again I can this, say this is my first substantive comment so i i have no idea if that's a stupid question and and it's, if it it's is not it's, a stupid, it's not a stupid question um uh i will say big y didn't really come up to within all the months of conversation the planning board had about when this was kind of being developed Big Y didn't come up as a consideration at all. Um, uh, I at least first heard about it when the uh, in the town council meeting when they referred it back to us and to the CRC. Um, and then I don't know where those concerns came from, but you know they were communicated by town councilors and not by Big Y ownership or you know, somebody who was more close to the real estate business. All right. Um, uh, Bruce, we'll go to you and then Jesse and then Lawrence, if you still want to speak again. No, I mean, Je Je Jesse's before me. Yeah. Well, I, I just wanted to res just respond to that really briefly, if that's yeah. all right, Jesse. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I don't, again, like bear with me here, everybody. Sorry, um, but uh, it would it would seem to me that that uh, what Nate described in terms of adjusting the requirements for for that piece of the overlay um, uh, could address or assuage some of those concerns that have been raised. Uh, I also hear hear Jesse's point that um, you know if the planning board feels like this is a this is a um, a, a good step forward, then 
you know, we should consider what it will take to, to get it moving forward rather than, than hung up further. But, um, uh, it, it seems that, that, you know, there could be a, a viable path forward here, um, with the sort of, uh, adjustments that Nate described. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, Just, Bruce, Jesse's we'll before me. Oh, Jesse's. No, sorry. Jesse's Jesse put his, his hand down. His hand. <laughs> well, no, I, I, I dropped it when I went off mute. Sorry. I would like to come. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, Jesse. I'm, I'm having trouble keeping up. Yeah. Yeah. Apologies. Um, um, first comment on Lawrence, but you brought up, I, I haven't heard any actual concrete evidence. Um, but again, if I look at what's happened in town, whenever any project has been built in the 18 years I've lived here, the stores that were there go away and don't come back. There are some new things, but they they just, they don't come back. And we have no control over that, right? Um, we can't zone for that as far as I understand. We can't influence that at all. And so even with Nate's plan he just laid out, which I think I, I agree is reasonable, but I still think there's a very good chance that in the construction, if something were going to happen, Big Y would leave, and it, who knows what would come back? Who knows if the new owners of a 60-unit place there wouldn't care about what goes in the first floor for three years and wait until something happens, just like we've seen in town four or five times. So again, that's all pushing me towards moving the boundary just to, to help this project move forward, just as you just said. All right. Uh, Bruce, why don't we try you now? Um, this is an interesting question. I think I, uh, too, hadn't heard anything about Big Y that suggested that it was under threat until this uh, came up in town meeting. And then I did think about it a bit. And I I, I think a little, as Jesse does, or maybe a, a fair bit, uh, that uh, it's hard for me to imagine that you could develop that site in the way in which we're enabling um without having the, the the retailer leave and then whether it would come back again is not clear it might um but on the other hand um this is um a valuable and, and uh scarce shall we say site or opportunity in town there's not many places in town that we've been able to identify that you could put with um to 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 broad consensus of the town uh, this level of uh, create the opportunity for this level and density of housing and specifically that would be uh, very suited to student housing so um and there are not many lots along here so foregoing the big y opportunity seems like we're um just whittling away at what is already a fairly small slice of real estate so i think that those two are uh, important and they're kind of opposed positions and I'm trying to reconcile what I think about this and uh, and wanting to move the thing forward I think is important but we might not have to give up on that straight yet away uh, because uh, uh, I think we should try and figure th uh, think this through but I think on balance at this point I'm trying to I'm inclined to keep big Y in I'm in I, I think Nate's suggestion is a really positive and constructive uh, uh, thought that would support the argument that um, that would at least give it make it possible and, and would create some incentive for big Y uh, or a big Y to retain or remain. Um, particularly, you know, we're putting a lot of housing back there. It, it's, it's really hard to read the future. It's, whether they say it's hard to make predictions, especially about the future. So, we don't know, but the, the 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 preponderance seems to me to be that we should we should um, back the horse that has the biggest opportunity to provide housing in the place where we in the limited opportunity in this place that we have. So I uh, think I'm inclined to keep Big Y in at least for the moment. All right, Bruce. Uh, I guess I will say. You know, we can do, we can recommend whatever we want. <laughs> um, you know, the, the politics or the, the how town council views it. There were a number of counselors who were 
worried about big Y. So I'm fine with keeping it in there, requiring 100% first floor retail or commercial. And, uh, but it, I think the odds are that they're going to strike that out. Um, and that's fine. You know, we recommended more housing there. And if town council wants to limit the potential for housing, you know, some, some people may accuse them of not, you know, of, of implicitly encouraging more houses to flip over because, you know, we didn't find a relief valve, but um, that's, that's their call. All right. Um, I will say, uh, just if I can interject, I was, uh, during the deliberations when we were developing this, I did wonder about the healthcare across the street, which I view as a little, a little more precious actually than Big Y. And I think it's more geographically positioned because it's right on Route 9. Ambulances can go from there straight to Cooley Dickinson. And so, you know, I hate, I hate to uh, expand the exclusion zone, but, you know, if we're going to cut back, if we were going to cut back the extent of this to include Big Y, how would we do anything on the other side of the street? I'll just put that out there as a question. Lawrence. Yeah, so I'm 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 glad you raised that, Doug. Uh uh, because that that isn't uh I think um a concern that's on on my mind too. And and I I I wonder, Nate, I, I just I I have in my head the way that I've seen things like this unfold other places and uh, you know, anchor retail that that was previously one floor surrounded by parking becomes, you know, the first floor of a development where there's a great deal of, of mixed use housing and, and it works really well. Um, uh, and so I could imagine a situation where where that that works um, uh, quite well here, too. Um, I, I guess the two questions that I have to sort of interrelated questions are um if if we did decide to have the appetite to um uh to you know call for um uh, a specific use of the first floor in that big Y piece of the parcel um how specific can we be uh you know can we say is there a certain type of retail that we can call for i mean could we say it has to be a grocery store again this is my this is my ignorance of of um, uh, of being a recent addition to the the committee here, um, so forgive me if that's a ridiculous question. Um, and then similarly across the street, I, I've seen you know other places where there's there's you know dedicated medical development that happens you know part and parcel with with um, mixed use developments. Um, similarly, could we require that 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 piece of the overlay? is is used for that purpose again i'm i'm probably betraying quite a bit of ignorance here um but i'm just trying to think creatively about how we can assuage the concerns the the reasonable concerns i would i would hate to lose big y too um that that people have uh while at the same time ensuring that we can use the maximum amount, amount of this geographic area for for this needed housing uh, Nate, do you want to comment on that? Sure. Yeah. So, like in the zoning bylaw, we you know we have use classification. So we, you know, we could be specific in terms of that. You know, we, you know, um, you know, it it could be then that that limits development, and so it could be that it gets so specific that nothing really changes because no one will come in with that specific use, which is maybe what people would want, or someone who comes in has to then, you know give it some serious, you know, consideration before they actually just try to develop it. I mean, I will say what this overlay, what this overlay isn't doing is forcing this to happen, right? It's just providing another opportunity, right? So like I said, there's already zoning there, there's already an overlay zone. And so this would be another overlay zone. And then really it's up to the owners if they're willing to accept an offer from a developer or from another owner. And so, you know, if, if Cooley Dickinson wants to remain, they can remain. We're not saying, well, all of a sudden you have to build a mixed use building. 
but what we're saying is the overlay is providing, if someone voluntarily decides they want to use the overlay, they can use the overlay for mixed use buildings only. If someone wants to put an office building in, they have to follow the base zoning that's already there. If they want to do something else other than a mixed use building, they just use the zoning that's there. And that could already happen, right? So if someone wanted to put in a big office building, they could, and they, they could have done it years ago and they could do it now. Um, so I think the concern, right, though, is that the market in Amherst is so heavily skewed to housing and housing is very profitable that, uh, you know, it, it could attract a lot of developers and it could then change the minds of the owners or businesses. And so it is really hard to, you know, kind of predict how that would work, you know, is would the overlay make a property so valuable that someone who's invested millions and millions of dollars be willing to, you know, accept an offer at some point, I, you know, I, who's to say, right. I don't know um, how, you know, what, what those kind of thresholds and criteria are. It's probably different for every owner. Um, so it could be specific on either side of the road. I think, you know, the more specific you get kind of the more complicated it could get in terms of, you know, what, what's allowed there. And so, um, but that is a possibility, um, you know, changing uh, the boundaries of possibility. I think, um, and as Doug mentioned, the planning board makes recommendations to town council. And so, you know, at some point the planning board might make recommendations, the CRC might have a different set of recommendations, and then it's a discussed at the council in terms of how they would want to vote this. And so, um, you know, if the planning board can't get to a consensus, but a majority vote, then that, you know, that's what would win the day. Um, and, you know, it sounds like there's, you know, a few different ideas here. And like I said, if we continue the hearing, we could hear what the CRC discusses and what's discussed there. Maybe there's some other ideas as well. All right. Thanks, Nate. Jesse. Thank you. I had two questions, but now I have a third based on the last conversation. So I looked at our classifications and I didn't see how we could be that specific. You're saying we can, Nate, that we could say, oh, this has to be a retail establishment that sells food. No, I'm saying we we use the use categories in the zoning bylaw. So we would say, yeah. you know, like 3.350.0 or 3.350.1, 3.350.2. I mean, that that's where I would go with that. Not, but it's but it's still not that prescriptive, right? I mean, it has a category of use, but it's not like it wouldn't ensure there would be a grocery store there. Well, you know, one is a retail store, one is a grocery, bakery, deli, butcher shop, fish market, or similar establishment for the production and sale of food and beverage. I mean, we don't have a use category that is specifically. Right, you know, right. but we can, sorry, we can be that specific to say, okay, this lot has to be 3.350.2. We could in that, or, you know, those lots or that. Okay, I didn't, I didn't think we could do that. So that's something to consider. But my two questions were really just informational. One about the whole overlay district, and I brought this up last time, I'm not sure if you had a chance to think about it, Nate, which is if we do the whole thing, don't change the boundary, and every square inch gets built to the maximum capacity that we're allowing, what's the number of units we're talking about? And then likewise, if we do move the boundary, how does that, what percentage does that change? Because mm -hmm. that to me is an important calculation in this decision, just like how much are we giving up if we move the boundary of the potential? And then the second question is procedural around the council. Um, so we're gonna make a recommendation. Can the council change that and then pass it? Or then if they change it, it has to come back to us again. No, typically that would, you know, it, they could refer it back to the planning board and CRC for further discussion. They could uh, accept or not accept all the recommendations and vote something that is you know, a compromise between what the planning board and CRC recommend. And so it doesn't have some of, you know, as some or not all, or, you know, it, it, there's a few different variations. Typically with the zoning amendment process, you can't expand um, or go beyond what the scope of the proposal was. So, um, but, you know, in terms of what we're discussing now, they could, you know, for instance, what if the council's like, actually, we want to keep the big white clause on the planning board says not to, they could just vote to keep it in, or they could vote to change it. You know, so the reverse it. is true too. If we if we did not recommend moving it, they could just move it the boundary. Yes, without coming back to us. Correct. Okay. Thank you. And so, in terms of the number of units, you know, some of it's difficult because you know every developer has their own formula, right? Some developers might say, "Well, mm -hmm. you know, 
I'll, right, I will put absolutely no parking and I'll get, you know, 200 units on a property where some other developers might say, I actually want to do a one-to-one -one ratio parking to unit. And so then, um, you know, that changes. And so, you know, I do think that in terms of the land area, the, the properties we're talking about are, you know, say it's a 30% of the overlay or, you know, how, depending on, you know, if it's one side or both sides of the road. So you could say, well, it's, you know, proportionally, if you thought we could get a thousand beds, you know, are we losing 300 beds? Uh, but is but, that 30% is the land use? Oh, I'm, I, I'm, it depends on how big we're talking, but, um, you know, if we're talking to the CVS property line and then across the street, to me, it, it does look like, you know, at least a quarter to 30, you know, a third of the, um, if we go all, all the way to Route 9. So let me, um, let me just, uh, and, and yeah, so, sorry to belabor the point, but in terms of actual buildable land use, because all the wetlands and like, you know, I think that calculation probably changes a little bit. Right. Yeah, so if we, wetlands. sorry, go ahead, Nate. Yeah, here's the property. So, you know, I, I wouldn't, you know, you know, I wouldn't, you know, you know, the overlay, I wouldn't draw it through a property, right? So if we said we follow this property line and then exclude the rest of it, then, you know, the, then this whole area would be removed. And so, you know, what, you know, if we say, okay, what is that, you know, if, you, if we think this was going to remain, is there maybe a redevelopment potential here and there could be some here. And so, you know, what's left is, you know, I think there's, we already seeing a development here, you know, there could be maybe, you know, something here and, you know, maybe here, maybe here, right. It's hard to say exactly, but there are land use constraints that would limit what we see. I mean, maybe in addition to this building, right. I mean, I, who knows what a developer, what kind of creativity they'd have, but, you know, there definitely would be, you know, three or four or five, uh, properties that could be redeveloped that wouldn't be if that overlay was moved. Yeah, I mean, it feels like, um, you know, you've got the post office, which I presume is owned by the federal government, and they don't sell things a lot. Um, and then the next building to the north has a lot of wetlands on that parcel. Um, and that parcel goes a kind of a little bit it goes a ways north, actually. It's a pretty large parcel. And there's wetlands kind of through it, all the way through it. Right. I mean, this all the, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, it feels to me like that southern end is actually where most of the potential is. And it may only be 30% of the, of the area, but it's probably 50% of the potential. Um, that's, so that's just, just a comment. Uh, Jesse, are you set or should we? Yes, thank, you. thank you. Okay. All right, Fred. Yeah. Uh, I think the cleanest way to do this is to keep the overlay the way, you know, from uh, uh, Amity Street down to Route 9, the way it's always been, but to uh, go with the uh, Nate's approach in terms of uh, the limitation within X number of feet, maybe 400 or something of the the southern uh, boundary. Uh, I think that uh, it would tend to protect uh, uh, Big Y while uh, making the uh, the overlay. Uh, uh, more uh, more of an integral whole so that would be my my preference uh, and this is a, something that I know uh, Bruce and I had, uh, had had talked about briefly about highest and best use and uh, whether we could we would be inadvertently uh, creating an incentive to uh, uh, shift the use of the southern end of this away from the grocery store and we we can address that using nate's approach and still keep the overlay where it's now drawn so that tends to be where i'm coming out on this but we'll we'll see 
Okay, Fred, thank you. Um, Lawrence, actually, Lawrence, before you go, I just want to mention one thing that came to mind. Uh, when we were developing this, we did actually start with this whole overlay going south of Route 9. And um, I, the board was slightly differently, you know, the, the membership has changed a little bit since then. And so there's probably, there could potentially be less of, uh, objection to that than there was before. Uh, and I know there was one member of the town council who wondered why we didn't go south of Route 9. So uh, as long as we're throwing out things, I thought I'd just mention that, um, you know, if we're, if, we're, if we're worried about the big, nine, big Y parcel getting struck, maybe we should expand the zone and then there'd be more remaining when, when that happens. Okay, Lawrence, you're on. Yeah, so so uh, just a couple of quick things. Um, uh, um, first, it it would seem to me if I'm hearing this correctly, based on the current zoning, somebody could, you know, buy the big Y parcel and tear it down and build an office building right now. Is is that is that right, Nate? What you're saying? So by saying that, you know, a developer has to if if there's going to be a mixed use development there in the future, that there has to be a grocery store there, which it sounds like we could recommend. We're actually protecting the big Y more than we would be if if it weren't part of the overlay district in a sense. Um so so from my perspective, I think that's a that's a really interesting option to explore. I I um agree with others, but but admittedly i'm 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 late to the game here um the other question that i had is uh since it sounds like we we probably need some more discussion of this and and we're probably not going to come to a recommendation tonight uh is d does somebody need to make a motion to continue this to december 4th if we decide to do that yes we will we will do that but i wanted to get through you know However much we want to talk about it tonight. Sounds great. Sounds great. First. I'll I'll I've I think I've taken up too much airtime, so I'll stop. No, nope, no, nope, that's you're you're just doing what you need to do. Uh Bruce. I'm I'm noticing that it's uh heading towards eight, and my guess, Doug, is that you'll take public comment and uh, shortly and uh sometime after eight we'll finish, we'll take the motion and and move to a break. But uh, just before we do, I I thought it'd be worth mentioning one thing, just for the uh, perhaps our general enlightenment. I don't know, but I know that architects, and I used to be one, uh, not uncommonly, particularly in built-up areas, are asked to uh, and and site planners and and so forth, asked to do some quite interesting and somewhat complicated uh, um, design mm -hmm. projects. Where, for example, you would imagine, how could we? Uh, um, uh, develop that site and keep big Y uh, functional. Um, and I would say that it's not impossible to imagine that you could come up with a scenario or two that would make that mm -hmm. um, possible. Uh, it, it, may, it may take a little bit of the store away, but there are other stores in that block that would go. So it's it's not inconceivable to me anyway, and not even at all inconceivable, that um, uh, if we provide the kind of uh, restrictive uh, structure that Nate talked about, uh, that couple, that restrictive structure that would incentivize retaining a, a large retail store like Big Y or occupying, along with the extra opportunity to build above that and exploit the, the upper part of the, the air rights of that site, shall we say, for, for profit, that it would be possible to um, uh, to, to uh, develop that site and retain Big Y, retain its operation until uh, as, as some kind of a new facility was uh, created that they could be moved into. Um, and then the second phase or the third phase of the development would take the Big Y portion down and, and, and continue it. You would have all sorts of issues about parking and so forth. Uh, maybe the developer would have to uh, 
purchase an adjacent site to make it work. Maybe they would uh, have uh, CVS go away for a while or forever. But it is possible uh, because I've been involved in these sort of things in the 50 years that I was doing this. Uh, these sort of uh, architectural and site planning and design challenges. So we shouldn't just assume that it's impossible. Uh, it's certainly nothing that we can require or regulate, but it is something that we can incentivize. And we should, I think, preserve the, um, the understanding that it is not uh, beyond the it is not beyond possibility that a development project uh, or a development challenge like that could be set and positively responded to. Okay. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, Jesse. Last comment, I promise. Um, so on, if we did that, let's say we left it in and we said that corner lot has to meet 3.350.2, which is grocery, bakery, deli, et cetera. That means that could also be purchased, demolished and build a 200 square foot convenience store that sells sandwiches and it would meet that requirement. If I understand correctly, like we can't, we can't be so prescriptive as to maintain the size in any way. Is that correct, Nate? It's really just an information question. Right. So we, we couldn't, I guess we, we could try to say a minimum square foot, but typically we're not, we're not going to get into that, you know, that level of detail. I mean, my, my real point is we still, we can try and do that, but we really can't control any of it. And as we keep coming back to with this project and others, developers are creative. And so, <laughs> you know, well, my they're gut, my they're gut they're tells gonna look me- They're going to look for the loophole. That right, lets them, right. And, you know, and my gut tells me with the market right now, if we let it get developed, we're not going to retain this function. That's, that's what's partly fueling my- thought on the on this specific. well we did we did talk about having a 100 percent requirement still, that the first yep. floor was retail or whatever yeah, but but it's it's an unknown what that would be and how soon it'll be populated as we've right. discussed yeah i mean the owners of that property they own a number of properties around massachusetts in new england and a few outside of the region uh, they don't they don't um operate residential or, you know, I don't even think they do mixed use facilities. It's all shopping plazas. And so they are redoing a shopping plaza, um, you know, in, in, um, on route two right now, they've done some around 495 and with new buildings, like things that look like they were just completed in the last year or two. And they'll do, you know, a grocery store with, you know, two restaurants and something else. And it seems like that's what their uh, primary objective is. And so, you know, they purchased the properties. There's two, I think they own, maybe it's three, but for 20 million or more five years ago. And so to me, they're, you know, they're invested in this site and they're probably invested in it because of big Y, right? It seems like that's what they do. They manage a, a lot of properties that are stop and shop properties, um, you know, Shaw's or other grocery stores is really what they do. Not as far as I can tell on their portfolio online, you know, even because in some of the other communities, I think they could probably have done mixed use buildings, but they haven't. That's not to say, right, that they wouldn't, right? Who, I mean, it it is really difficult to kind of guess what would be, what would happen here. And so what is the highest and best use? It could be that the owners in Big Y say, wow, this is going to be really great for us if the rest of the overlay gets developed. And then maybe, th maybe then they would see what would happen, but I don't know. I, you know, I could, I would say, wow, I'm going to have a lot more customers that will walk to my store, but you know, we don't know if that's the prerogative of the owners or, you know, a developer might come in and say, well, you know, I'll offer a lot of money because I also have, will have a lot of people that could walk or live there. Um, All right. Um, I guess I will go to public comment. So at this point, if you are in the public and would like to make a comment, we will give you three minutes. If I see a, just a ton of hands, we might take a five minute break first, but that's not to dissuade you from putting your hand up. All right, uh, Pam, why don't we bring Aly Alyssa Rubenstein over? Hello, Alyssa. You hello. Hello. 
Oh, um, okay. So um, give, us, give us your name and your name street Lisa, address, and you'll Elisa, have three minutes. Okay. Elisa Rubenstein, I live at 25 Greenleaves Drive. And uh, I just want to pull the zoom lens back a little bit and uh, inform you that there are over 300 units of housing, senior housing, very close to Big Y and Stop and Shop and the CVS. And people there, many of them have limited access to transportation. And so these two stores, these two grocery stores and CVS are extremely important to um, our survival. We don't have the option to just go anywhere. And reading in the newspaper and some of the discussion afterwards about your earlier planning meetings, it was kind of, oh, this is just a strip mall. There are other grocery stores. We don't need this, but the residents nearby really do need it. And if it would be a tremendous loss. So I think instead of just focusing on housing units, what are the people in all of these housing units going to need? And those are services. And we don't have many services in Amherst. We used to have a grocery store in the center of town and that was moved to um, New Market Plaza and it's not there anymore. So what we have is precious and I, I really would hope you would find a way to protect it. Okay, thank you very much, Alyssa. Are there any other members of the public that would like to say something? Uh, Pam, let's bring over Louise C. Hello, Louise. Hi, uh, Louise C., uh, 14 Greenleaves Drive. Uh, I prepared one of the statements uh, for the last meeting uh, because Jesse and I happened to have the same errands that day. Uh, Big Y isn't just a supermarket. It's a hub of services that I had no idea that the medical center was in play as well. So that when we go to Big Y or we go to the medical center or we go to CVS, we are patronizing various hubs. I've now prepared another comment, which I'll submit uh, to the planning board, maybe for, before the next hearing, but I'm gonna say it now. Uh, I want to talk about two Amherst centers, one that grew commercially around the Big Y in the 90s and a much more attractive and well-planned mixed-use center in North Amherst, the Mill District. Recently, I happened to visit both of them on the same day. I live near Big Y, where I do half a dozen errands a week, but that day I stopped in the Mill District en route from Coles Lumber. The Mill District is a mixed-use development of mainly student apartments and stores built adjacent to the Red Barn, the Atkins Farm Market, vacated due to lack of business after two years. The residential buildings are arranged in a pleasing way around a small green with small shops at ground level. After several years, some of the commercial space is starting to fill up. Harold's Ice Cream, the Cupcakery, Provisions, a gift shop, a couple clothing shops. So why doesn't the Mill District work in North Amherst as a town center everyone hoped it would become? It's because all the useful services like the North Amherst Library and Post Office, a convenience store, laundromat, and liquor store aren't meaningfully linked to the Mill District. The Mill District is not a hub. It's a place to get an ice cream cone, a cupcake, or a bottle of wine. Drive down University Drive, and within minutes, you can do laundry, mail a UPS or post office package, get a blood test, an x-ray, get your teeth clean, your eyes examined, pick up a prescription at CVS, get a huge, a huge sandwich maker at Goodwill, and do a week's worth of grocery shopping and park the car just once. Um, if you live nearby, you can do that on foot. Many of my neighbors do. The Big Y Plaza is a bustling hub of services that serve a large population of students, residents from the center of town, from North Amherst, and from all the condos, senior living, family living, private houses, and student apartments lining Route 9. Big Y itself employs many UMass students. It's not attractive. The parking lot is a nightmare, yet it's packed day and night. 
many of the students who live around Big Y Plaza at Aspen Heights at the corner of Snell and the other student apartment building in the middle of University Drive can buy a toaster oven at Goodwill for their apartments, pick up shampoo at CVS, get a cut stitched across the way at Cooley's Urgent Care, see a physical therapist without ever getting into a car. The same is true of the hundreds of 55 and up seniors who live nearby Greenleaves and Vesta. Many of them make it to Big Y on foot. Uh, I urge the counselors to move the boundary. Amen. All right. Thank you very much. Maybe we should look at the Mill District next. Okay, I don't see any more hands from the public for, for tonight. Uh, I also see that Johanna has joined us just a moment ago. So the time now is 8.02. I think she arrived at 8.01. 8.01. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry to see that she's masked. So maybe she's not feeling well. Uh, mm -hmm. That's unfortunate. Um, Jesse. Sorry, just to point out, there is one more hand up. In the, yeah. Oh, in the... thank you. Thank you. That just appeared. Uh, great. So let's move over. Bring over Jonathan Slater. Hello, Jonathan. When you, when you've unmuted, please give us your name and street address, and you have three minutes. Jonathan Slater, uh, representing 170 University Drive, um, uh, for the uh, Cooley Dickinson uh, Medical Group. So, just for the for the listeners uh, from the community, uh, our intent is to to not be impacted by this. Our our only intent on participating here is to ensure that. One, uh, we can deal with the wetlands and the stormwater runoffs. And our goal is to eventually occupy that entire corner that we currently have and build a, a more robust uh, facility for the community. Uh, so our hope is to have new business in the future. Um, Thank and, you, Jonathan. Uh, yeah. that's, that's great to hear. I'd love to come to your facility rather than where I go now. And, and, and then another another piece to that is that in the beginning, I, I I heard it was like speculation if it could impact the, the the plaza and hearing for the first time that they're not the owner of it and it could be the, the owner of the building that impacts that that um, that move was certainly an eye opener for for myself, too. But uh, um, interesting conversations and I appreciate all the efforts going into this. So thank you. OK, thank you. All right. Um... I don't see any other hands other than Jonathan's at this point. So um, do folks want to talk about this more after the break, or should we just go ahead and continue right now? Uh, I saw a couple of heads nod in response, I think, to, con to just continuing now. So Bruce, what do you want to say? Uh, it's the mo motion to continue. Okay, and Nate, the, we were going to continue to December 4th, is that correct? Or was it December 5th? Uh, the 4th, oh, there, there's two uh, hearings already scheduled for that evening. Um, uh, and so I, I was going to probably ask Pam to what time we think this should be, you know, continue to. We can't start earlier, we can always start later. And so um, I don't at, know if we feel like uh, 7.15 or something, Pam. I was going to say seven o'clock, but uh, whatever. We, uh, we have a hearing that's scheduled to start at 6.55, and then we have one, I believe, scheduled to start at 7.10. Is that correct, Nate? I believe that's what it is. So I would say you, you could say 7.15 with the idea that we can start later, but not earlier. Okay, so 7.15 on December 4th. That's the motion. All right. I will. Lawrence, why don't you? Well, I was just going to say second, but I'm a little disappointed, Bruce, because I thought this this could be my first motion. That's why I brought it up earlier. Oh. But it's OK. Second. Oh, oh, Lawrence, you'll get it. You'll get another chance. I'll I'm yield confident. if that's uh, <laughs> I'm happy, happy to yield. <laughs> OK, so we have a motion to continue to the December 4th at 715 and a second. Uh, anybody want to comment? 
Uh, Johanna, I saw your hand for a moment. Anything you want to say about this before we disappear? I'll just say I'm looking forward to hearing, viewing the recording and hearing all the comments. And I'm not sick. I'm just in a meeting where everyone has agreed to mask to avoid being a okay. super spreader before the holidays. OK. All right. Um, before we leave this topic, uh, the two hearings that we have December 4th, are they likely to be long conversations? Well, I think that um, one is the high school track. So they're, um, you know, it's a, you know, they're, you know, the, if you follow the, if you've read any articles and, um, you know, they're proposing to reorient the track north south and then, you know, put a new field inside and then a field next to it with lighting uh, in site improvements. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't think it will take too long. And then the other one is the plenary subdivision for 422 Amity Street. So again, this is a, you know, an, an effort to freeze the zoning there. And so the planning board recently reviewed one for Shrewsbury Road Solar. And so uh, there's not you know, much to discuss there. You know, I, I would say that if any of those are going longer, I think it would be okay to continue either one of those. You know, so for instance, if the if the high school track ends up being a big discussion, we could always say, well, we'll only talk about it for an hour and then continue it if we're not, you know, at a concluding point. That way we could get to every topic on the agenda. But, yeah, I mean, I, I'm kind of feeling like we probably, we ideally we would finish this, this conversation on the fourth. Um, I'm not sure how much more we need to talk about it. Uh, we haven't actually zeroed in on what we what we want to recommend. Um, tonight, it sounded like there might be a majority who, well, I I could I could name either either of the two options: cutting cutting off the uh, the boundary or leaving it and and requiring a hundred percent of of retail or uh, commercial. Personally, I would be more broad about those restrictions rather than requiring supermarket or food, uh, but um, we can talk about that later. But I, I'd i like to have the option of having a reasonably extensive conversation on the fourth that where we actually finish the conversation, if we can do that. I think we could. And I, if, knowing that if the planning board likes, you know, would agree to that, I think, like I said, we could limit how long the other hearings go if we wanted to continue them. I mean that preliminary subdivision, you know, that could it, it could be as short as you know, ten minutes, right? I mean, there's not a lot to it. It's a um, but. Well, you know how we always find a lot to talk about, regardless. So, all right, okay. So, um, if nobody has any other uh, comments to prolong this, I will say let's go ahead and vote to continue. Um, So we'll start uh, with you, Bruce. Uh, aye. Support. Thank you. And Fred? Aye. Lawrence? Aye. Jesse? Aye. Karen? Aye. And Johanna? I'm an aye. I'm an aye as well. That's seven in favor, no absences, no abstentions. Thank you all. So the time now is 8.10. We'll take a five minute break. Please come back at 8.15 and turn on your video to let me know you're back.
All right, my, my clock is showing 8.15. I see three other board members back. <clears throat> Well, Jesse, I'm glad to see you're getting some dinner. Dinner sounds great. <laughs> What's that, Johanna? I said dinner sounds great. Later. Aren't you on the West Coast? I'm in Denver. Okay. So dinner, it's about dinner time for it's you. It's about dinner time. Starting okay. to grumble. All right. I have a vat of lettuce here, but <laughs> All right. might go off screen. Well, let's see if Fred can show up and then we can get going again. Uh, Lawrence, will you be able to stay with us all evening? I'm hoping so, yeah, unless uh, a small person starts screaming in the other room. Yes, I will do okay. my best. All right, great. Mm -hmm. Okay. Johanna, I like your background. It's a really cool old building. Yeah, you should take a picture of it before you leave and then use it as your background. Ooh, that's a good idea. I'm going to do that right now while we wait for Fred. Well, let's give him a couple more minutes and then here we go. All right, time is 8.19 and we're all back. We can resume our meeting. Uh, next item on the agenda is item five, accessory dwelling units. And I know Nate included in our packet a draft ADU bylaw with a, a, let's see, a couple of pages here. Yeah, three pages and a fair amount of editing. Nate, you wanna give us the overview of what, we, what you've done? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, I worked with the building commissioner and staff uh, to, you know, keep working on the ADU bylaw. And so, you know, some communities are bringing them to fall town meeting to try to get them ready for the February 2nd 
uh, time when you know uh, the state legislation will take effect. Um, <clears throat> and you know what we had discussed last time, there was a you know uh, for the you know, planning board said let's just keep it relatively simple, you know, uh, with one ADU per property with standards and conditions. And so, <clears throat> you know, the draft by I presented previously had a number of uh, different um, uh, uses, you know, use permitting processes and different things. And so, you know, kind of based on the conversation and then working with staff, you know, I, I'll, I'll sh share my screen in a minute. I'll walk through it. Uh, but the hope, I mean, my idea would be if the planning board is ready to, you know, try to recommend this to council, um, even if we, you know, if the planning board acts soon, you know, just like the university overlay, university drive overlay, you know, council would would take it up, refer it back to the planning board and CRC as a zoning amendment, and then it would go through the process. And so, you know, I think I, I can, like I mentioned last meeting, I'm not sure we'd have this bylaw in place for February 2nd, but it would be in the works. Our current zoning has standards and conditions that the building commissioner in the town can apply to permits. We can't apply, you know, regulations that are inconsistent with the state, uh, you know, law. So right now we require owner occupancy, which couldn't be um, allowed. And then we have some provisions for um, some other, um, types of ADUs and how they're permitted. And so some of that would have to change a little bit, but we do have a bylaw in place. So, you know, some communities don't have anything. And so they, they you know, they were working really quickly to try to get something in terms of some, you know, say um, design guidelines or some permitting. So I'll just share my screen. Um, and, you know, really, I, I don't, I will say that I, nothing's really been added uh, necessarily in terms of uh, allowing more ADUs, it was uh, kind of taking the comments and incorporating them in. And so one would be, as Fred mentioned, and then uh, discussed adding the um, accessory dwelling unit as a definition in, in, in section 12. So it wouldn't be within you know section five of the accessory uses, it would be a new definition. Uh, and it's pretty much the same definition. Um, that we had, I think what we are being clearer about here is it's 900 square feet of habitable space, which is a defined term. Uh, before we had had some other sentences after this, and so really, um, uh, you know, we have we define habitable space in our zoning bylaw, and it mirrors what the building code um, has. And so, I think just have actually saying this is not larger than half the floor area of the principal single family dwelling or 900 square feet of habitable space is much clearer than what we had had and habitable space is a defined term in the zoning bylaw as it is now and so it's something that inspectors use when they are reviewing projects and uh, something that we you know we can use uh nate yep do you want to go through the whole thing and then take questions or do you want to do them as you go. Uh, we can do them as we go. All right, then I'm gonna ask you about that provision. Mm -hmm. Does the state law say an ADU can be as large as 900 square feet anytime? Yes. Yeah. yeah, 900 is the is what they have. Well then, if it, that, wouldn't it be whichever is larger? I mean, I guess, if 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 I have a a thousand a twelve hundred square foot house, principal dwelling, right. you're going to be limiting me to six hundred square feet, because that's the smaller of either half or nine hundred, right. and then is that in conflict with the state law? Because that would the state would allow me to have an ADU of nine hundred. No, this this phrasing is right from except for the habitable space they would uh this is straight from the legislation okay so they include the one half the floor area yeah okay thank you and i will say later you know when we get to it we do allow larger than 900 through something else so you know or or larger than half or 900 so that's allowed okay um you know the purpose uh was um, 
maybe update it a little bit, is to expand and diversify housing supply by making efficient use of resources without requiring the creation of new lots. Accessory dwelling units are intended to meet the changing housing needs of the community by providing smaller units in existing single family neighborhoods. And so the purpose before may have said something similar. Uh, this, you know, is, was, um, you know, like I said, kind of summarizes the conversation we had. And then it's also looking at what some other towns are kind of language they're using. The applicability, these, these statements uh, were in the previous version. They may have been, you know, reorganized or, but, um, you know, really it, um, Going, uh, you know, ADU shall be located on the same lot as the principal single family dwelling and zoning districts that allow single family dwellings. And so that's uh, kind of a summary of what the state law says. Uh, they shall be accessory in use to the single family use of the property. Um, the lot shall have an existing single family dwelling in order to allow the creation of an accessory dwelling unit. And an accessory dwelling unit may be completely contained within an existing single family dwelling attached, detached as a separate building or within a detached structure, an accessory dwelling unit may be within an existing building or new construction. And, you know, the staff had commented and this, my, it's from me, but, you know, do we need to have say this last statement or any of this last statement here? Um, you know, right now in our bylaw, we, the way we permit things, we call it contained, attached or detached and you know, to me, it's, it doesn't necessarily hurt, you know, I don't, you know, I think it can help explain what it is. Um, but, you know, there's a question of, do we need to get into this kind of explanation? We are saying we will only allow one accessory dwelling unit by right, which is what the state law um, is requiring on a single family property that meets the definition of the accessory dwelling unit and the general requirements of this bylaw. And so we had removed some of these other conditions we had um, just because of the way we defined it. And, you know, I think it was somewhat redundant. Uh, we're allowing accessory dwelling units by site plan review, uh, you know, through the, with the planning board. And so uh, if we had a, if we said by special permit, then uh, some of these would become non-conforming because we've already allowed some ADUs to be a thousand square feet. And so by keeping it site plan review, it, you know, they're not, um, they'll remain conforming. And then um, it, it, it has some implications for what could happen on the property if it becomes non-conforming. So this is probably a cleaner way. So an accessory dwelling unit greater than half the floor area or greater than 900 square feet, but no more than a thousand square feet. So if someone would like to do a larger ADU, Doug, as you mentioned, they would have to do it through site plan review. Uh, an accessory dwelling unit located in a new detached structure proposed between the front yard setback line and the front facade of the principal single family dwelling. And so this is a new, a new condition, right? So if someone wants to put an ADU in their front yard as a detached, as a new detached structure, it would be by site plan review. Um, All right. And so uh, let's, Jesse's got his hand up. Let's see. Yeah. Thanks. Um, question about the, uh, the, this idea to allow up to a thousand square feet by site plan review. How many, if we kept it at 900, how many would be non-conforming? Do you know roughly? Like we're we talking dozens or just 10 or how many? Yeah, and, I don't think, I think it would it'd probably be under, I think it'd be single digits. And the, re the reason I'm asking is to me, if it's written this way, every single new one is going to go for a thousand square feet would be my guess because why if you are building yeah, we have a we have a hard time rejecting any site plan review so I'm, I'm inclined to maybe keep it at 900 because it doesn't sound like that onerous there wouldn't be that many who are not conforming or we could say by special permit but well, you know, Nate, I mean, at least my understanding is we really can't reject something through site plan review, right? We can sort of nibble at it, but not right. cut it off. I mean, we do allow a thousand square feet now. And so some of it would be, we, you know, we allow it now. And so yeah. we could allow it through site plan review. I mean, I, I recognize that, but, but I think we're going to have a lot more ADUs given the way the law just changed, right? 
Don't we now require owner occupancy? We right. do. That's so what I'm that's saying. A change, and that's going to open the floodgates. Correct. Right. So again, I would be inclined to try and limit size if we can. Brad. Nate, I want to. Uh, I I've been thinking a lot about this um, because. The, and I think you know my major concern with the legislation is the complete removal of owner occupancy. And I get it that in a lot of areas in the state, that's not that that is probably intended. But in Amherst, that emasculates the best way to uh, regulate antisocial behavior shall we say, uh, in these applications. And uh, now uh, owner occupancy is gone. And uh, over the last couple of days, I've come up with a, a possible approach that uh, is a bit outside the box, but I wanted to run it by you. And that is uh, one of the things that the housing subcommittee is looking at, we're looking at this, and we're also looking at uh, uh, student housing and defining it. Uh, so let's suppose that we came up with a definition of student housing. And that's where the owner occupancy thing really hits the fan in the town of Amherst. So if we successfully came up with a definition of student housing. Then I'm thinking um, we could uh, come up with a uh, language that said that in the event that either the principal housing or the accessory housing uh, uh, met the terms of student housing as defined in chapter 12, which is where it would end up. Uh, in that event, then uh, basically, uh, when we can't say owner occupancy, but we could say then an adult has to be present. And uh, the way we can, uh, we've, we've actually already uh, come up with language uh, that, that kind of does this because we came up with it for um, 4555 uh, uh, South Pleasant Street uh, for the, the property that's now going to be run by Amherst College. Uh, there's language in there about 24-7 supervision. And I think we could adopt that language and put it in here. And in that way, we are not re we are not requiring owner occupancy, but we are requiring adult supervision. And I think that that might sneak through the literal text of state law because it would not disallow uh, owner occupancy, uh, or it would not mandate owner occupancy. So uh, this has just been percolating in my brain over the last few days. And I'm wondering if this is an approach that, uh, that we could maybe take here that would go a long way towards addressing the negatives that are uh, huge in the town of Amherst. All right, Nate? It could, I, I do think that, um... You know, it's later on in the agenda, actually, the definition of a student home. I think the difficulty would be uh, actually identifying it and confirming it on properties to then enforce it with a, you know, a 24 seven, you know, management plan or, or something. And so, you know, I think when Jesse met with staff, some of the discussion was, you know, we're not staff won't, you know, go out and inspect every property to see that they're a student home and uh, so I, you know, we could, so I, I do think if that were possible and, and it was in place, then I would say, Fred, it sounds like what you're suggesting could work. Um, it could be that the state deems that to be unreasonable regulation. And so 
kind of the test of all this is, um, you know, what's reasonable or unreasonable. And so we, you know, that's what hasn't been determined yet. And, uh, you know, some of it would be if we, you know, move this along, we're hoping that um, by the end of the year, the state will have guidance out uh, and, you know, town meeting um, votes are now heading to the state for review and approval by the AG's office. And so at some point there will be some, hopefully some guidance on something like that. So some communities are trying to limit the number of bedrooms in an ADU, limit the size in terms of stories. Um, uh, I think some are trying to limit occupancy and lease terms. And so it could be that some of those are deemed unreasonable. And then what you propose, you know, may or may not be. But I, I, I think that what you said would could be a way to do it. I'm just not sure that it would work if we can't really, you know, confirm if a student home is or isn't, you know, on a property. Nate, is the owner occupancy entirely struck for any ADU or only for those under 900 square feet? So according to state law and way, the way our bylaw you know, is written, we are only allowing one ADU on our property. And then we have this site plan review, which is still only one, but that, you know, may be bigger or located in the front yard, essentially. Um, and so it can't, there can be no on, no owner occupancy requirement. If for instance, the state law says you can allow more than one and it shall be by special permit. And then, you know, if we wanted to have like two ADUs on a property, it could be by special permit with an owner occupancy requirement. But, you know, from our previous discussion, you know, it sounds like we don't want to even have two ADUs on a property. So really all we're allowing in this bylaw is one ADU and one is by right, which is basically just, you know, uh, follows the state and we could, you know, strike this and then have these general requirements. And then, you know, essentially any property that has a single family home could buy a building permit, as long as they meet these general requirements, build an ADU. And that's what the state's intending. That's what they want. Um, and you can then require owner occupancy, depending on where you are in relationship to like public transportation or, you know, transit line, or whatever, there's a, a few phrases there. You have to, you know, you have some restrictions on how you regulate parking, and then you can't have unreasonable regulations. And so, I think the, like I said, the big question is what does unreasonable mean? And so, you know, in our general requirements here, you know, I don't think that anything's unreasonable, um, right? But, you know, maybe the state says, wow, you're, I don't know, you know, you're saying the lot can't be condo wise, like that's unreasonable. I, I mean, I, I couldn't imagine, I don't know, right? What will come out of all this, but. Um, okay, all yeah. right. All right, we got a couple more hands. Karen. Yeah, so in Amherst, it's going to incentivize uh, investors build uh, buying single family homes because now they can then rent those to students and put an aid. They're just going to make more profit uh, because they can sell, uh, they can rent to so many more people. I don't know how we're going. I, I like Fred's idea. I think maybe we can't, it'll be hard to um, to prove that it's a student house. We're working on the definition, but it at least gives us one, one tool that, I mean, I can tell you which ones are student houses in the neighborhood. Um, and at least, you know, there would be something that that's in place. Even if it doesn't work, it's better than nothing. Um, I guess in the in the long run, we're going to have to think of something if we want any kind of uh, owner occupied families to be able to compete in the market here. We're going to have to do something like have completely different property taxes for houses that are owned by owners, give them a real break on property taxes. So in that way, they can perhaps compete. We're, we're going to have to think of something. All right, thanks, Karen. Bruce. Interesting idea. Um, it's a lot of this hinges on uh, a successful and enforceable, uh, practically enforceable definition of a student home. 
Uh, Fred, you were talking about the definition of student housing, and I think you were men meaning the definition of a student home, but uh, maybe not. Anyway, my question is uh, to you, Nate. Uh, this section, accessory dwelling units uh, uh, by special permit, uh, that can be no more than a thousand square feet. Do I correctly understand that this has been put in simply to uh, uh, be a, be a mechanism for formally rendering um, a handful of uh, existing uh, units that would be non-conforming under the uh, the nine hundred square foot bylaw? And if that's the case, yep. how important? Uh, it, it can't, why can't we tolerate uh, changing a bylaw in such a way that renders some uh, non-conformity? We seem to have put the whole bylaw in place uh, 60 or 70 years ago, creating massive areas of non-conformity, and we have a mechanism for dealing with it. So why do we have to put this, this thing in here at all? Why can't we just get rid of its accessory drillings by special permit or site plan review? Uh, we could. Um, you know, we do allow a thousand square feet now. At first, we allowed it if they were an accessible ADU. We, we found that you know we, you needed that much square square feet uh, to have you know maneuverability and visibility in a unit. Yep. But uh, Bruce, to your point, we could just, uh, like I said, remove this altogether, um, and then we just allow one by right with general requirements, and you know some properties may become non-conforming uh, because of that. And what's the, what's the danger or, or you know, a downside? Yeah. Um, the, the building commissioner thinks that maybe a thousand square feet. So, you know, what's interesting about the state law is it's not very clear. So, you know, do you have to limit it to 900 or could it be a thousand now and still meet state law? You know, sometimes, you know, regulations will state a minimum, but not a maximum. And so, you know, or, or however it's worded, kind of to your point, Doug, <clears throat> I think the downside would be um, if a AD, if a property has an ADU that's a thousand square feet, you know, what kind of the guidance has been at the workshops as well, it's not an ADU that meets state law. So then they could put an ADU that meets state law on it. So it would be a property that could get a second ADU. Um, but I'm not sure how many of those there are. And then, you know, we talk about the 900 or to 1,000. There's also this, you know, front yard, you know, we have allowed one or two ADUs in the front yard setback, um, you know, and it, and it worked out fine. You know, uh, you know, is that a concern? You know, is it, you know, I know I, I think some staff think it is and some staff doesn't, you know. Yeah, I think it's it's fine myself, but yes, to allow them, I, I like to... having that flexibility. Yes, uh, can I continue, Doug? Yes, go ahead. Uh, so, um, if if it weren't to be eliminated altogether, uh, I, I I guess I, I thought maybe the idea of the nine hundred feet uh, of knocking a hundred square feet off the maximum area was because suddenly it. We have we we lose the control of owner occupancy, and so there was a, a kind of a small knee jerk reaction to say, well, let's make the building smaller. I don't know that that's going to make a big difference. Uh, it does. I do understand that that hundred square feet could make a lot of difference for an accessibility unit. So I rather like the possibility, therefore, of having a thousand square feet. So I'm you've you've moved me in that. So I'm thinking now that I would say. Uh, uh, why not in the uh, in, in with the nine hundred to simply add the possibility that it could be increased to a thousand square feet uh, at the discretion of the uh, permitting uh, authority, and then you 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 if we if it's important to keep it at nine hundred, um, we have the discretionary power to increase it uh, to a thousand feet at the discretion of the permitting authority for compelling reasons of you know. Uh, facilita facilitating uh, accessibility, I think that would probably be the the wording, something like that. What what how what mechanism of discretion or consideration would you suggest? Site plan or special permit? Um, 
I don't know that I've thought enough about that, but I think <laughs> uh, I rather well, think that the know, planning the, board is a is a is a is a is a is a better deliberative body for that sort of thing. Uh, the, the zoning board, as my limited experience, is is more of a quasi judicial operation, and this seems to be more to do with function and and uh, and so forth. So, um, well, it just seems like you know with the. 900 square foot ADU allowed by right, those aren't even going to come to us. No, right. So we need a mechanism by which people are required to come to us if we're going to have to render a judgment. Okay. So if so that my, then, yep, understood. My thought would be if, if it's really for accessibility purposes, we would try to manage that administratively with approval from the building commissioner or staff because, I mean, to be honest, what a waste of time um, for the planning board to have a public hearing um, for that. So if it's really for an accessible ADU, could be a thousand square feet, <clears throat> I think we could write it in that it could be, you know, I mean, it, again, you know, it will be designed to be an accessible unit. Doesn't mean it has, a, you know, an occupant that needs it. I don't know. <clears throat> but they will have to then, you know, have the turning radius and, um, you know, hallway widths and other things, door widths, you know, all the clearances to me to be an accessible unit, which, you know, is, is slightly different than what it may be otherwise. And so I feel like we could probably write that in uh, and have the building commissioner and staff confirm that through plans and other things and not have to have a public hearing on that. I mean, honestly, if it's for that, I, I actually think that it wouldn't be um kind of the right use of the planning board's time or the zoning board's time i agree all right well that's something to consider i guess nate mm -hmm. jesse thanks um i mean i agree bruce with what you said it's a reaction from me on there's going to be lots of them we should keep them smaller uh, you're saying that ten percent difference doesn't is not concerning to you. I I agree. If it were truly to be accessible, that would make sense and should be allowed. Um, I guess I don't know enough to know if nine hundred versus a thousand square feet that is accessible is a difference in a number of occupants potentially. Because if we allow that, let's say you can build nine hundred and three people comfortably live there. But then you can build a thousand and you could get a fourth person in there, even if it's accessible. I still think they're all going to go that way. So it's not really getting at the purpose you're describing, which is, I mean, yeah, they'll be accessible, but I think they'll still be designed to just maximize tenants with that extra space. So I'm still inclined to lean the other way and say, no, we should limit the size. All right. Karen. So I was actually, uh, when my daughter was moving here, we were thinking of turning our garage into an accessible unit and they could live there. Um, I think the, the, and the architect, John Kuhn, was very limited by the, by I think it was 800 and he said, but if you make it accessible, then you can make it a little bit bigger. But so, you know, I don't think we're gonna, I, I think we should allow it under certain, circumstances. We're not going to stop the degradation of the neighborhood with having many, many more um, people trying to cram in students by limiting the size. I think we should stay flexible in, in this. It would be nice if we thought that we were doing something positive by limiting the size and, and having less students and less parking, but I don't think that's really realistic. I think we should be a little bit flexible. Okay. Nate, uh, why don't we why don't we go on? All right. What do what do uh folks think about having one located? I, I mentioned it, but in the front yards. Um is do we need to have that by be by site plan review or do we just remove this? I mean it was an addition. Um we had kind of had it in a general requirement below before, and it was moved up here to be under site plan review. Um, you know, some bylaws have it. We, we have it 
Currently, we say to the extent feasible, try to you know move it back behind the front facade of a building. Um, but you know, uh, you know that's that's a determination made by staff in terms of how feasible that is. So, Karen. Forgot to put my hand down, sorry. Okay, Bruce. Um, Nate, I think if there is a precedent, in other words, examples of uh, ADUs in front setbacks, in front yards, then we don't need it in the bylaw to indicate that it, it's possible. Um, typically, I don't think people are looking to bylaws for um, inspiration about things to do so i don't think it's going to needs to be there for that purpose um so it doesn't seem to me to be a necessary uh piece i don't think it's doing any harm really except uh, adding uh column inches but uh, in the interest of reducing column inches i don't think it's really helping very much if we already have the precedent established all right. Yeah. I mean, you know, after this discussion, I would almost, I talked to the building commissioner, but I would probably just delete this, <laughs> this whole section and see if we could have, you know, maybe a requirement for accessible units. Um, you know, unless we really think a thousand square feet is something we want to keep in through site plan review. Like I said, it seems like uh, it's a lot of effort for the planning board and an applicant. And I'm not sure it's the best use of a permitting board's time. Um, I if we're not allowed by right, uh, so um, so for general requirements, <clears throat> you know this was one was already um, within the general requirements previously. It was it was now made the first one and it kind of reworded. So it says any new construction for an accessory dwelling unit shall conform to the dimensional standards of the zoning bylaw. However, as an accessory use, uh, they don't um, they don't trigger the additional lot area for from table three. So. We, we already have this in the bylaw, an accessory dwelling unit doesn't um, trigger uh, an additional lot area. And so because it's an accessory use, it's not you know, a principal unit. Uh, the accessory dwelling unit shall be located on a lot with only one other dwelling unit. And so that this would have been stated in the general requirements, we just kind of restated it. So everything in black has been there. Um, the accessory dwelling unit shall be used exclusively as a residence with no use of the residence for business purposes. And so, you know, I think Doug, you had said, well, so what does that mean if someone wants to do a home-based business or something? Um, you know, is that, you know, do we want to regulate the, the ADU that way, that it really is only as a residential, you know, there, there can be no other accessory accessory use in, the res, in an ADU. Um, yeah, I mean, Say I, you know, I build an ADU and I'm I'm a landlord for five years, and then I realize that my little hobby business is taking off, and I want to just kick out my tenant and, uh, you know, run my little business out of the ADU. What is that a problem? Well, it does the ADU is it no longer a dwelling unit, or is it now an, an office? I mean, really, we'd only allow it as a, like a home based business. Yeah, well, it wouldn't be, I mean, does an ADU stop being an ADU when there aren't any tenants there, or I don't know? Well, I would say yes, if you're no longer using it as a residential, as a residence, right? If there's no tenants or occupants. Okay. Um, well, well I, I mean, to me, this is, I don't know that this is, necessary i mean is it a problem i mean i i don't know you know the building commissioner kind of asked is this necessary as well i don't know that it's a problem um it was just you know it's a you know i guess you know if the more of these will be um you know permitted and constructed do we want to have some requirements on it i you know like i said i'm not sure it's you know become yeah. a problem Okay, well, we got some other hands. Maybe they have other opinions about this. Fred. Uh, I take it, uh, Nate, that if we pursue my suggestion that uh, that this is where that language would show up. Right. I will, uh, at the next 
I think at the next uh, housing uh, subcommittee meeting, I'm going to uh, try and uh, get something together that we could bring to the full board. Okay. Bruce. Um, I don't think it's necessary or a good idea even to have this uh, additional prescription over uses of business purposes. Um, what we're finding that uh, these days, particularly with the ability as after COVID for people to have home-based uh, businesses and so forth. Um, I know, for example, I have both daughters' families here. Um, both the husband and wife of each of the families works from home. Um, a lot of what I've been doing uh, for my kids' houses in the last five years is uh, finding ways to make um, basically home offices in and around their houses. Uh, and and there are any number of folks uh, of that generation um, who are moving back to town and um, and bringing their, their work with them and need small spaces, uh, basically bedroom spaces of sorts, uh, in order to do this. So I think it would be... Um, a retrograde step to do this. I think what uh, we need here and one of the important uses for ADUs is probably going to be from time to time to support uh, embryonic businesses, Doug, just the way you were saying. Um, it's important for the growth of the town. It's important for the establishment or the maintenance of the town as a vital place. Um, it's not going to hollow out uh, if we allow uh, opportunities to support um, people moving back uh, uh, because they like the school system, because they like the space, and 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 God damn it, nowadays they can bring their work with them because that used to be the problem. Uh, there wasn't enough work for people to come and and live in Amherst, even though lots of people would have liked to. Now, uh, days that's changing. Um, people are bringing work their, their their jobs with them, and they need spaces like this to do that. And I think it's. Uh, um, uh, almost a terrible idea to to prescript uh, to restrict uh, to restrict or eliminate the possibility of using ADUs for this purpose. I would absolutely get rid of that phrase. Okay, that was clear, Karen. Yeah, I was actually going to say the same thing. So, if you're living in the house and all of a sudden you decide you want to have. Um, make that your artist studio out there. I think that would be great. You could have students come and, or you want to have it be a, a daycare center, not just working in a bedroom remotely as many people do. I, I agree totally. I think we should strike this. All right, uh, Fred. Well, we're, yeah, I would agree. We're talking about home occupations and uh, uh, my Three family house here uh, for a long time. Uh, the uh, uh, barn uh, barn loft was my wife's psychology office. That was true for I think almost twenty years, uh, and done so completely in accordance with the bylaw. It was a, it's a home occupation. The bylaws always recognize that. So uh, I don't think that's a problem at all. All right. All right. We're heading toward a majority on that, Nate. Oh, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Um, all right. You know, these are just like, you know, like this was, you know, this has been just, you know, ideas for the board to consider. And so I'm not, you know, I'm not really going to hold fast to that one. Um, we removed, a, you know, something here about what design review principles um because we're not really allowing uh, you know the permit granting authority at this point hopefully we're it's just going to be a by right um we did remove this in the next one accessory dwelling units we say shall be designed so the appearance is compatible with the existing single family dwelling and with the character of the neighborhood we removed shall, shall be smaller in scale such as height and massing um you know i think that you know, speaking with the staff, I mean, the height thing is interesting because you could have it be just a foot taller and all of a sudden you're saying, well, that's not allowed. And in some instances, you actually would want it maybe to be taller to, for, you know, architectural purposes. And the massing too is something 
that I think, uh, you know, it still captures it, designs for the appearance is compatible. And so I think trying to say smaller and scale and massing is just not necessary. Uh, but, you know, again, that's for the board to discuss. We did remove this one to the extent feasible. An accessory dwelling unit shall not be located between the right of way and the front facade. Um, that that's what's in the bylaw now. We did say unless by a special permit, which we've removed from the bylaw. So if we, you know, if we delete this section, we could still have this condition that says to the extent feasible, try not to place it in the front yard, which is what we have in the bylaw now. Um, but you know, there's precedent, and is it? I'm not sure it's actually a, that big of a concern. Nate, uh, the the one about the character of the neighborhood, right? Um, since these are by right, this is putting the building inspector in the position of judging that. Right. Is he comfortable with that? Sure. I'll mm -hmm. say, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, it's a good question. So at the current building commissioner and staff, you know, I think uh, do this, you know, when, when COVID started, we had article 14, uh, which allowed, uh, number certain uses in the um, we can put conditions in place administratively with approval by the building commissioner and they follow through with it. Um, you know, uh, some in some communities, the building commissioner and staff may not like having this uh, review, but in Amherst, we found that it actually works really well. So, uh, you know, if we had stricter requirements in certain sections of the bylaw, the planning, the the planning board, you know, would review it by site plan review, right? But then it becomes, it's it's allowed by right. And you almost, can't, like you said, it's hard to say no. But if we have strict requirements in the bylaw, uh, say for the issuance of a building permit, the building commissioner can work with an applicant to get to, you know, so it's approved and just say no to that, to issue the issuance of a building permit. So, you know, um, and so in, in article 14, we had a number of conditions that, the building commissioner was really comfortable implementing. And so I, I'm, you know, I, I feel like what was here uh, would be, could be used. And, you know, the, and it also relies on other staff. I mean, we could, we're not, mm -hmm. you know, it's not like it's, you know, only on the building commissioner, it would be likely that they would look to other staff to help with that review. Okay. Well, that that's good. I just wanted to be sure he was prepared to yeah. judge the character of the neighborhood. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's one of those, yeah, it's, it's, Right. Okay, Fred. Uh, yeah, one thing to keep in mind there is that, uh, uh, as a, I think as a matter of law, uh, the uh, zoning board of appeals uh, can always be requested to review this kind of a decision made by the building commissioner because he's the zoning enforcement officer. Right. So there is a mechanism for a, uh, a public discussion of uh, something like this in the event that uh, there's a real uh, butting of heads between the building commissioner and, the, and an owner. And right. that may be something to keep in mind here. Okay, that's nice. That's good to hear. Great. Um, and I don't know if you feel like putting this back, you know, to the extent feasible and, you know, we wouldn't have the, by special permit, but um, we remove this one. Any new exterior entrance shall be clearly secondary to the entrance of the principal dwelling. Um, we do have this condition that's still there to the extent feasible. Any new entrances, including exterior stairs, shall be located on the side or rear of the building. Um, and then, you know, the rest of this had already been in place. Um, we included uh, design and landscape standards in terms of parking. We say there shall be no additional or separate driveway curb cuts to serve the accessory dwelling units unless allowed by the Department of Public Works. And, you know, I, after our discussion about how do we limit, you know, parking uh, on a property, I had put this in there and some staff wasn't sure this was the right way, a maximum uh, lot increase uh, for driveways or parking areas, there'll be no more than 400 square feet for a dwelling unit. But, you know, there could be some general requirement here that says that, you know, no more than, 
you know, three additional parking spaces, which is exclusive of driveway aisles or driveways, um, you know, per ADU or something. We do have the lot area and dimensional standards in the bylaw, um, but, you know, they can be kind of generous. And so, you know, some of the, some residents commented at the last uh, meeting that, you know, the concern would be with an ADU, all of a sudden you get, you know, a 10 car parking lot. Um, and so, you know, I, I think, you know, the, uh, like I said, the local historic district commission had kind of discussed how they could regulate parking, which is tricky with the local historic district, but, you know, with more residents could be more parking. Um, and so, yeah, I, you know, there, there isn't, we haven't really said much there, um, but, you know, there is some, maybe something for consideration and it looks like, you know, you know, the rest of the, yeah, I was gonna, the rest of the conditions haven't changed. So it's really just what has been discussed. All right, we've got three hands up, uh, Jesse. Thanks, on the parking point, um, the best I could do searching around came up empty with ways to regulate maximum parking as far as I can tell. But a uh, question about this ADU. <clears throat> so when someone comes in to, they wanna build one, do they have to submit a parking plan the way you do during the rental registration or is that totally separate? I think we say here that, um, I thought I had it. Um, uh, we hear, um, we say adequate off street parking shall be provided uh, as provided on a parking plan submitted to and approved by the building commissioner and approved in, in a, you know, in accordance with the design standards. So, you know, any improved parking area has to meet some, uh, you know, standards in the bylaw. So we do have that there. Oh, well, well that, sorry, will that include the original lot or driveway? So, so will this plan have to show both dwellings with all the cars, all the spots yeah. planned yeah. there, not just the new one, right? Right, right. Okay. Yeah. I mean, and, and then what, what authority, if any, does the building commissioner have to look at it and say, oh, wait, there's eight spaces here. That's too many. Or is there nothing I mean, new other than, oh, they made a plan, so we're going with it. Yeah. I mean, you know, unless we, it's, it seems like, you know, really egregious, there's not, you know, for instance, you know, my driveway right now is a double, you know, it's double wide and 80 feet long, right? Or whatever. So I could park. Or I think it's even longer, right? So I could park 10 cars in my, or, um, right? Eight cars in my driveway, whatever it is. And so, you know, is that adequate to serve the ADU? But, you know, some people don't want to stack cars and then back in and out, right? Or whatever it is. And so they might want to have some, a separate parking area. Um, you know, I think it's, you know, that comes into what are the dimensional standards on the property and how close are you? And then, you know, this isn't saying necessarily, you know, and you know, we, we limit how many are in the front setback. Um, we're not saying it has to be behind the building or anything. So, you know, would the building commissioner say, oh, well, you want to pave and have three other parking, you know, four parking spaces off the driveway. Is that too much? I'm not, you know, I'm not sure. It, it might be, a, you know, a lot by lot or case by case. Okay. Yeah, no, it's it's a good question. You know, we uh, require a parking plan for rental permitting, and in, in part because we want to make sure that all the, you know, what the landlord says in terms of bedrooms or occupants can be, you know, they can provide the parking on site because we're not, you know, we don't want them to then be putting them in the front step back or along the road. And so it's a similar thing here, but, you know, it doesn't necessarily get into how nicely designed is it. Okay, thanks, Jesse. Fred? Uh, don't I remember that the state law has uh, very specific rules about what you can and can't do regarding parking that are conditioned in part on whether you're uh, within a half mile of walking distance to a, uh, a major transit facility, uh, which I remember we had a discussion about does that does a bus stop count as that? And your feeling, Nate, was no, it doesn't. Uh, and so, I I I think this the state law is uh, 
in terms of what's available in the town of Amherst, the state law is, I think, uh, very clear that uh, the uh, that parking uh, can be addressed uh, through the uh, the permitting process on the ADU. Am I missing something here? No, you're right. You're right. So, you know, I don't think that the the way that language is written applies in Amherst because we don't have a a term, you know, a public transit terminal. You know, we had said that maybe that's you know Peter Pan or or some other not. It's not a bus stop. It's not like the bus stop on route. You know, some bus route. Um, so we could we could, and I, I mean the question would be, you know, so we have a, a few of these. Um, requirements for parking here. You know, the applicant shall provide a minimum of one off-street parking space. It shall not be allowed in the front setback except as provided in the bylaw now. There shall be adequate off-street parking based on a plan that's approved by the building commissioner and no additional driveway curb cuts unless approved by public works. Uh, you know, but what we're not saying is you, we're not limiting that number. And I think that was the concern of the residents that spoke last time. Like, could you just say, you know, like no to so you know, so many parking spaces or whatever that is. We have, you know, it hasn't really been determined. And so this, this condition that was added and then taken out said there, you know, a maximum lot increase or maximum increase in lot coverage of 400 square feet per dwelling unit, which isn't a lot. And then, you know, you know, it's maybe complicated to calculate. And so, you know, would you have something that says, right, you can add no more than three parking spaces per ADU, but a parking space to me isn't a driveway or a drive aisle. It's actually, you know, a, a you know, a, a formal parking space. And so, I mean, I don't, I don't know if that's the board feels, you know, one way or the other, like I'm saying, most places have a driveway and the ability to park cars. It's just, you know, will, the owner, developer, occupants want to, you know, have cars parked on the existing driveway or the surfaces, or do they want like a separate parking lot really? All right, um, Fred, I, are you set? Uh, yeah, well, I just, on, in, I was gonna drop it, but on that, uh, the zoning bylaw is very clear on what constitutes a parking space. You know, it's nine feet wide and it's 18 feet long, basically. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I don't think we'd want anything less than that. Okay. Fred, your hand went up again. Oops, sorry. Okay. All right, uh, Karen. So I see this as a possibility of limiting uh, the amount of people that live in the uh, ADU. I don't think, I think three is almost too many. It's just a little ADU. And you, if you have one or two people in it, you, you should have one or two parking places. You don't, th this might be, are, are we allowed to do that? Are we allowed? I mean, I, I don't, I don't think we should um, approve a maximum of three, I think that's too many. Well, you could probably do a four bedroom house in 900 square feet. Well, you don't have to put four people in it. Well, right now we don't limit our, anything. Our owning. We limit? We don't. And the, wait, the, the, limitation is, the limitation is the lot coverage and building coverage in our dimensional standards. And so, you know, if for instance, on my single family property and I have this big driveway and I'm like, well, oh, I have four kids and I want to have more parking space. I'm just going to now make it, you know, my 80 foot long driveway, double wide drive. And I'm going to put, you know, four pull off parking spaces off my driveway because I hate having to back out my car every time my kid leaves. I could do that. And anyone could do that. We don't really limit that. It's the dimensional standards and, you know, in the bylaw and, you know, depending on up here in the front setback. And so, you know, I, I, so really what the neighbors are saying is, can we limit the parking? Can we say, you know, either limit the cars or limit the parking space, you know, the 
impervious surface. And so right now we don't really do that um, in the in the proposal and, and in our current bylaw other than through other mechanisms. Um, can we, can we is the question. That's just as they ask, can we limit? Oh yeah, I mean, to me, I don't see it as limiting the number of occupants. You're just limiting the number of vehicles. Um, that's important. Well, the other thing is, um, okay, so say you tell me I can only have two cars associated that I'm building parking for as part of my ADU. Right. Well, but my principal house needs right. 10 spaces. Right. So, okay, I'll build two for the ADU, but my principal house needs another four since, right. since I, you know, I have, I bought more cars for my classic car collection. Um, so I don't know that tying, you know, tying parking spaces just to the ADU is going to really work. What? Okay. Um, Jesse. Thanks. Yeah, that's what I was trying to get at before that. We basically have no mechanism to limit parking spaces. I was just trying to make that clear. And I did hunt around other towns and locations and didn't find any examples of that either, because probably it's a really hard thing to do. Because I'm sure we all do have neighbors who have classic old, old cars in their driveways. We're, you know, <laughs> we can't stop that. All right, Fred. Um yeah, but the where you get to that is uh, like in the RG district, uh, which is near and dear to my heart. Uh, you have a a lot coverage limitation of forty percent, and uh, I can tell you, uh, as the person who drew the parking plan for my uh, property, uh, between the uh, the, the coverage of structures and the coverage of the driveway and the required parking of two spaces for each of the three occupancy, that's six spaces. Uh, I can tell you that uh, my property is on the hairy edge of 40%. It complies, but I would be hard pressed to add, I think even one more parking space. Uh, at 18 feet by nine feet. That's a, that's a lot of square feet. Uh, so, and that's where you are going to uh, have some limitation here. And and Nate, those those uh, lot coverage requirements still apply, right? Right, right. Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, I think we might be saying the same thing different ways, but right. I, I think you know what Doug said. You know, you were right. I mean, if you know, and I've been giving my hypo hypothetical example, but um, you know, you have to comply with the dimensional standard, so the lot coverage and building coverage. But a lot of homes may have a pretty big driveway that serves a single family home that can accommodate a lot of cars. And so that's what I was saying that, you know, it's hard to say, well, then you can, what's the kind of limitation you put on the ADU because you can manipulate, you know, what serves what. Um, and, but I, you know, I guess I, you know, the reason why we're discussing is because I think it is a concern, right, that a, a number of people brought up and I think people are aware of if you have eight people living on a property and all eight people have cars, how are those cars accommodated? Um, well, and then all eight, you know, eight people have boyfriends and girlfriends, and now you've got 16 cars, um, many of which park in the frontage within the setback on the grass. Yeah, I mean, I think so that, I, yeah. I mean, the cars are almost as objectionable as the people. Right. So I think that's why we have that condition, you know, based on a parking plan reviewed and approved by the building commissioner, it does become an enforcement issue if, you know, cars are commonly parked all over the grass, then we can take, a, the town can take enforcement action because there's a parking plan that needs to be followed. And so, I mean, that's, I don't want to say it's the best we can do, but it's one thing we can do. Um, okay. Lawrence. Yeah, I'll just be really quick. I, I was going to ask the enforcement question that, that Nate just addressed, um, you know, what's keeping people from just parking everywhere as they do anyway. Um, uh, but I do want to say, I mean, I think if, if the intention behind this is to, um, uh, address parking, that's one thing, but if the intention behind this is to use parking as a way to, to limit the number of residents and ADU, 
then we should be having a different conversation about the number of residents that are allowed in the ADUs. Um, and I, I don't know what that looks like. I don't know how that unfolds, but um, uh, I just want to say, I think, um, you know, if that's where the concern lies, then I think that's what the discussion should be. Yeah, well, I mean, to get to step back even further on the intent, you know, the new state law, the intent is to have more housing in, in the state. So, it, you know, our effort to limit the number of residents in the ADU is counterproductive and may be considered unreasonable. Yeah, and and I I will just say I mean I I I think uh, the point that was that was raised earlier by Fred you know the discussion of a definition of student housing could be really valuable here I think um, uh, if if that's the concern that that um, we're trying to get at and and address um, I just want to name that you know I I think the parking issue is a real thing and nobody wants to have a neighbor who's got a million cars parked everywhere um, but I also think um, the the issue that a lot of us are getting out in this conversation um, uh, is is distinct from from the parking question. Yeah, I mean, I will say the student home definition was discussed when the new rental registration and some you know property bylaw was um, moving forward last year, and you know the council and some subcommittees really decided not to pursue it because it is really difficult to enforce. And so, I'm not sure that I would try to put it into this bylaw and then insert it as a definition to somehow try to get 24 seven management on a property with an ADU. That to me, that would just really slow down this process in, in, in a way that's not necessary. And you know what I'd rather do is you know work, work through the ADU bylaw. And then if we think we can do something with a student home definition, incorporate it after, but not try to bring it in and you know uh, make it um, integrated into this bylaw. Um, one other thing I was going to mention is that the state fire marshal, uh, um, there's been some discussion about what are the requirements for new, uh, for fire access and other things with new units on a property. And uh, I don't know, there, you know, there's distances from where the fire truck can park. And, you know, if you have to have a big enough driveway, if not, then there's, you know, you have to, add, you know, Anyways, I don't know how it's going to play out, but um, for instance, uh, if you if you're not within so many feet of where the fire truck can get onto a property, you have to have um, the ADU needs to have a sprinkler system, and maybe the single family home does too. And given a number of properties in Amherst and the distance from the road or from where a fire truck could actually get onto the property, it would mean that the ADUs would need to have a sprinkler system. Um, you know, it's not going to be in our bylaw. We say it has to follow all all other codes and regulations. And so, you know, I think we're going to go through our process and have an ADU bylaw. And we might find that, you know, there's fire requirements that, you know, ha have to be met. Uh, you know, it doesn't change what we do, but, you know, like I said, there are other codes in play. You know, there's always septic and other health requirements if there's something, you know, if it's in an outlying area, uh, we're not addressing that, right? So, um but just for the board to know that, you know, the, you know, a lot of people are looking at it now because with this legislation, right, the, right. I mean, I think the hope is that there's more housing units across the st state. The concern is there's more housing units across the state. And what does that mean for all the other codes? Um, so they're looking into it as well. And so it could be that it's not as easy to build an ADU as you might think if you need to, you know, upgrade water service to have some fire suppression. Yeah, that that'll, that'll uh, really restrain what's done if that's the case. Oh, okay. I know. I'm All right. Sorry. So Nate, uh, I'm not seeing any hands. The time is nine twenty-four. Um, we've been at this for almost three hours. Um, do you need something else from us tonight, or can we? let you think about what you heard and come back to us another time. No, yeah, I think, you know, um, I'll come back to you another time. Okay. Fred. Yeah, I, uh, um, Nate, I, I, I hear what you're saying about the looming February 2nd effective date and so forth, but 
I don't want to lose track of uh, this approach that I think a lot of people were intrigued by in this discussion. And uh, so I, I anticipate a very busy uh, housing subcommittee uh, because I want these, I, I want this going forward uh, and and quickly, uh, because in in the town of Amherst, uh, without some kind of uh, a, a addressing what is going to be the outcome of ADUs uh, with unprincipled ownership, uh, that is a a, a massive and serious and very present problem. And uh, we need to be uh, really working that. All right, thank you, Fred. Jesse. So the related question, um, at several points, the idea of talking to our state reps and trying to discuss a exception to that requirement came up, is that still a conversation worth having? Do we think that's dead in the water, has no possibility? Who knows more than me who can comment on that? Not me. Yeah, I mean, the housing trust, I think, talked about it. I think, you know, some of it is that, you know, as a kind of a key piece of legislation for ADUs and then, you know, for Amherst to come and say, well, we'd want to have a home rule petition to an exception for this I'm not sure it would be, it would go over that well. However, Amherst is a unique market, but I'm sure every community would say they have a unique market. Um, and so, you know, I, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I understand the concern, right? There's been a few applicants who have been denied, uh, you know, a non-owner occupied duplex because that requires a special permit. And it's like, well, are we going to see them on February 3rd <laughs> to have an ADU? And so, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's something, I, yeah, I'm not, I think it is something to consider. I, but I, you know, I, I don't know if anyone's talked to the, our, you know, the, you know, the towns, you know, the representatives or anyone at, um, at the state level. But um, I, I think to try to go in with a home rule petition as an exception to this doesn't seem like the best approach right now. But, um, you know, maybe someone already has or they've considered how to do that. I, I did right. think to um, Mindy, Mindy Dome about this. Uh, at I'm sorry. I did talk to Mindy Dome about this er early on, and she mentioned that there might be exceptions for certain places. She saw that this was going to be a problem. So, um, yeah, I think it's not off the table totally. We did discuss this specifically, and she did mention that there might be exceptions for certain places that would be impacted. Okay. Uh, Karin, did you have anything else? Okay, Fred. Yeah, uh, I'm. Well, I'm all in favor of pursuing that, but uh, I I kind of think that's. I mean, if if you're a state rep uh, and you're talking to a constituent, you usually say something other than no, uh, <laughs> whether or not you have any realistic hope of accomplishing it. You don't tell the constituent no, right. and uh, so yeah, I'm I'm all for pursuing uh, that kind of action. Uh, lightning might strike, but I think what we can do is, you know, we've got uh, if, if we can define a student resident and uh, residence, and I think we can. This is an approach that uh, I think is going to survive a court challenge. And uh, it, 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 I think it's plausible. So anyway. All right. Johanna. Thanks. I mean, I guess I want to just, maybe this is obvious, but the reason why the state passed this is because they feel like there's a need for housing and there's been too much local opposition for more housing. And so now they've kind of taken action into their own hands and circumvented local boards like ours. Um, the thought that we would somehow like 
I don't know, say, oh, we're a unique and special snowflake. We need different consideration, I think, would be like, yes. And that's exactly why we preempted you at the state level um, on these kinds of actions. So I don't know. I think like we should do what we can to make this work as well as possible for Amherst, but not put ourselves in the crosshairs of a potential lawsuit or a big political battle, in my opinion. Uh, Nate? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, what we were talking about earlier with University Drive is something that we need to talk more about, right? So if we're concerned that any development in town becomes student housing, then we need to say, well, where what do we do with students and where would we want to house students? And so maybe that, you know, we, you know, we have the general housing topic on the agenda and we've been discussing it at the last few meetings and I think we can continue to discuss it and maybe it becomes, you know, we talk to our neighbors or, you know, you know, we can broaden it to maybe have the housing trust, but, you know, I think it's, you know, the other side of the coin is if we're really concerned about an ADU having students, well, you know, what, where, where do we want to have students and how do we try to start changing some of those, you know, those discussions? Um, because I do think it's really hard to regulate it. And I do think it is a concern though, but. Um, yep. We need to give them somewhere else to live. I think the conversation with Mindy or about trying to get an exemption really needs to come out of town council. Um, and it's really not our battle to fight. So, you know, talk, talk to your counselor and write an email to them and say, you know, I've, I'm worried about this. Let's, why don't you guys write, get, get active with the legislature. Okay, um, I, I think that's enough for tonight on that topic. Um, I could be wrong, but I don't see any more hands. And I, are there any members of the public who are still with us who want to say anything on this topic before we move on? We are down to four members of the public. Yes, uh, Pam, can you bring over Jonathan Slater? Hi, oh, Jonathan. Again, Jonathan. Still, hi, Jonathan. Still here. There's one observation when you're talking about the ADUs that I picked up on was that it was taken into consideration that some may be able to turn into a home business. And I think that might impact parking and it might also influence advertisement and signage on the properties as well. Aside from that, um, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Just another thought. All right. Uh, was there anybody else in the public that wanted to say anything? Okay. All right. So time is 9.33 and we will move on. Let's see. General housing discussion. Um, Lawrence, I see your hand. Yeah, I was just, I was going to throw this out there. I, I don't know uh, if folks would be open maybe to, to, postponing the general housing discussion to to another meeting um just given uh given Fred's consideration of the of the um student housing definition okay well we we did put this in here in hopes that we could take some of the load off this the housing subcommittee so I don't know whether anybody from the housing subcommittee would want to talk about that definition anymore tonight, uh, or whether you really need to have another meeting on your own. Jesse, you you nodded your head at that, so maybe. Can I can I come at quickly? So so correct. We haven't met. We have some quorum quorum issues with only four members. We are meeting next week, um, so hopefully we'll move that along. There's not much more to say about it. Uh, you all saw the text. I think you're all welcome to join us next week. Uh, same time, same place, more or less. Um, I did want to make two comments related just quickly, just about the language we all use. And I think Bruce brought this up initially when we were talking about the definition that we really want to refer to it as student home, which is distinct from larger student housing projects. And when we're talking about these rentals, ADUs, whatever they are, we really like this term student home rather than other descriptors. And related to that, 
uh, in my mind, and this sneaks into our conversations often, and Fred, I'm going to pick on you a little bit because I know you, you won't mind. Um, I completely understand your intention, but I think we want to be really careful not to speak negatively about the population in general. I, I'm not opposed to students. I have lots of student neighbors. That's not the issue. The issue I'm really focused on, I think the whole housing subcommittee is as well, is retaining our town vitality with permanent residents, which is separate from having students here. And so when we speak about these issues, I think it would be in all of our interest just to be cautious with the words we use. Um, yeah, that's all I want to say. Thanks. OK. Um, the second item we had on here, uh, discussion of potential overlay for existing apartment complexes. Nate, I assume you put this on here. This is for those uh, complexes that are north of UMass and potentially upzoning that area. Yeah, so you know when we had our housing production plan in 2013 and then we had a comprehensive housing market study and that was completed in 2015, during that time, the consultant said, you know, if you really upzone those areas, it doesn't have to be just north of UMass. It could be like Rolling Green, Colonial Village, a bunch of places. And some of it was um, one that they're non-conforming now. Uh, so there, there is a special permit process to possibly allow density. But then if you, you know, if you actually, you know, regulated it and it'll maybe allowed it by site plan review with a little bit more intention, it would actually incentivize it. Um, and so, so the planning staff talked about it at that time with the zoning subcommittee, you know, came up with some language. I think that was sent around. It never actually became a zoning amendment. It was just kind of a discussion and then it didn't go anywhere, but you know, I, we, staff had mentioned it to the housing subcommittee, uh, and they were either interested in it, seeing it. And I, so, you know, it's just on this agenda as well, just for the planning board, uh, in part, because, you know, every once in a while, I guess a property owner or two will say, oh, remember, you know, there's a few that remember back, you know, 10 years ago, and they'll say, oh, I, I'm still kind of interested in maybe doing something. Could the zoning ever change on an apartment complex? Um, you know, I don't know how many would actually take advantage of it, but it's just, you know, for something, you know, for consideration, you know, I did talk to one property owner and they thought the expense of doing it and tearing down existing buildings to lose a few years worth of rent to do a phase development is complicated. And so this one owner wasn't necessarily interested, even if it was, you know, triple or quadruple the density. Uh, but, you know, there might be a few who would take advantage of it. I don't, you know, it, but, you know, so the town allowed apartment complexes, right? And then they were built and then we re changed the zoning afterwards. So now they're all non-conforming and actually couldn't be built today. Um, but so the idea was, could we do something with those? Especially some of them have pretty, uh, I'd say like inefficient site plans in terms of layouts and parking and other things, but. Yeah, I mean, that area was always one of the areas that I thought we could rel with relatively uh, little uh, opposition up up zone. Yeah. But the but the the area that came up uh, this evening, kind of the in uh, North Amherst, say between the, the 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 library there and the mill district, you know, we could think about a sort of moderate height up zoning in that area too, which is kind of kind of quasi-industrial now. And, uh, you know, I'm sure there'll be people who say, hey, I like being able to walk to my auto body shop. Um, and, uh, you know, I wouldn't want that to leave town. But um, maybe maybe that would be a, another area we could consider. Right. Yeah, or no, I mean, students, those, you know, the areas of North Amherst, I'm, I've always thought, like, you could do a grid network of streets and do townhouse style and triple the density really easily and still have it look really nice and have open space. But, you know, it does take buy-in on the part of, you know, could be more than one owner, but so that's what the point of that, you know, that's what that topic was. And there was some information included on the packet from a number of years ago. Yeah. Okay. All right. Anybody object to moving on from, from that topic? Uh, time is 940. Okay. So we, we talked uh, about 
I think we talked about new business earlier. Um, and we talked about the a and r subdivisions earlier, I believe. We did. We did not talk about ZBA applications. Anything we should hear about? No, I'm not going to report anything tonight. OK, uh, anything on SPP, SBR, SUB applications? I think you're really familiar with those. Let's see, the new ones coming on December 4th are the high school track project and then the preliminary subdivision for uh, 422 Amity Street. OK. All right, uh, committee and liaison reports. Bruce, what's going on with PVPC? I know you kept up with that while you were gone. <laughs> I did, I couldn't wait. Um, but there is a meeting tomorrow. Uh, they are quarterly meetings. Um, I think I reported on the face-to-face uh, -face at the, uh, maybe I didn't, I said I was going to it. It was a big disappointment. They had their, I thought this is the first meeting that we've had that we're actually face to face. I'm going to meet some people and, and so mm -hmm. forth. And they had this damn thing at the some marina bar down on the river mm -hmm. in South Hadley. And they had it in a functioning bar and they had a presentation and most of it was somebody talking you couldn't hear. It was in a long, it was almost everything you can imagine was wrong with the way they conceived this. And it was a complete goddamn failure. And I left um about a third the way in because it was just pointless so that was a huge disappointment i thought i was going to actually connect with this organization after two years and i didn't so we're back to zoom and i'll tell you tomorrow uh what happens which probably won't be much because i just understand this bloody organization i can't get into it it's too fragmented um it's i mean i i hope there doesn't seem to be a role for the commissioners. Uh, I, I tried to find out what the organization does. I kind of know what the organization does. What is my role in that? What is Amos' role in that? It's hard to rise above minuscule. Um, anyway, that's my optimistic report for this evening. All right. So I, I would suggest maybe you talk to Jack Jemsek. Because he had, he always seemed really high on that group, and I know to stay I have talked after to, he left the board. I know I have talked to Jack, and he's on the executive committee, and uh, so that's part of the reason why I'm not super concerned about uh, Amos' interests as far as this organization is concerned. I, okay. I, it marvels me how he managed to connect with it. All right. Okay. So the next item is the CPAC committee, and. Um, Unfortunately, Lawrence has notified us that he cannot serve because his home life and work life are too demanding. So would anybody like to be our representative to the CBAC committee this year? Uh, they are kind of in the midst of reviewing proposals and making putting together recommendations. Lawrence. Yeah, I just, I just, I want to apologize to the committee. I, I know I, I raised some of these concerns when I, when I put myself for, or apologize to the board, I should say, I've already apologized to the committee. Um, uh, and I, I really thought that I could make it work with a lot that I've got going on right now. And, and it became clear very quickly that I just wasn't going to be able to be a good participant on the committee. So, um, uh, before this comes back up, I just wanted to apologize to all of you all. Cause I, I thought I could make it work and I couldn't. So I'm, I'm sorry for that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Bruce, if you don't like CPAC, what about, or what if, you, if you're not into PVPC, what about CPAC? <laughs> well, Doug, you know, I know a fair bit about CPAC because I've made applications on four or five uh, occasions in the past five years and mm -hmm. successfully. Uh, so I had to understand how they work in order to be. But the trouble is, um, let me, uh, the, um, the fact of my life right now is when I got back from Australia, I, I found out that uh, the NACF, uh, uh, the, 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 the lease transition process with uh, simple gifts and so forth, they the, the final uh, prospect with 80 acres crashed and burned. And so they're uh, done. They're probably going to... Um, uh, well, the point is that it is uh, 
You've got other a, fish to fry. It's it's a, a huge load. We're going to have to find a farmer. We're going to have to decide how we deal with the potential bankruptcy. We're going to have to figure out how we can buy these assets. We're going to have to figure out how we deal with our local community who've been wondering for two years. So there's a there's a there's a there's a colossal slab of work that's suddenly fallen on me as chairman of that board. And uh, unfortunately, even though I'd probably be pretty good at uh, picking up quickly, uh, I just can't do it this year, Doug. Okay. All right. Is there anybody else? I, so Bruce, I'm sorry to put you on the spot. I was no, I, that was sort I, of in jest, uh, but I, know, Doug, I had I, hope. I appreciate the skill and, and, and the finesse with which you function as a chair. <laughs> and I therefore appreciate you uh, coming head at me like that. I think that's what a good chair does. I do it. And sometimes I successful and sometimes like this evening, it's just doesn't work out. They just can't. I'm sad. Okay. Is there anyone else prepared to step up? No, not at all. Okay. All right. Um, I think I will have to notify the the um, town manager that we're not going to have a representative this year. Um, Karen? Um, maybe I can do that and not do the design review. Um, the design review doesn't take very long. It's kind of fun and they're very capable. They don't really... How mm -hmm. often do they meet? Um, not that often, um, maybe once a month. Okay. Well, I mean, CPAC will be done in January. I don't think I can do both right now. Uh, All right. Hmm. Yeah, I was, I, I was trying to find the CPA committee schedule, but they, they've been typically meeting every Thursday. And so last year they met and they made the recommendations to town council, you know, by the end of December, actually, I think even. So, you know, they, they, um, they've had presentations the last two weeks on proposals and then they'll have um, maybe one more and then a public hearing and then they'll meet a few times to finalize recommendations for the town council. So I agree that they'll, they'll be done with their work by mid Jan by January at the latest, you know, by the end of January, if not by yeah, the end. Yeah, I, I wonder whether it's almost too late for somebody to come in. You'd have to get up to speed really, you'd have to read all the proposals, you know, review the hearing, you know, the recordings, um, you know, you've missed your chance to ask questions. So it, it is a little late. Um, yeah. Yeah. Don't forget it. Okay. Bruce? Um. I, I agree. I think, Doug, that's what you should do. It doesn't as though we haven't tried. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I like your idea of switching me from uh, the committee that I'm so enchanted with uh, to CPAC, uh, because I, I have had experience on that committee. And and I the, the workload on the elementary school building committee is tailing off. And if it hadn't been for the uh, the, the this colossal uh, thing that's just happened, I probably would have been able to say yes. But next year I probably can, and uh, someone else can take over from the PVPC, which would be delightful. And uh, I think we can promise the, uh, the that you can promise you can represent to the town manager that there are very good prospects for a, a solid uh, participation from this com this board next year. But um, circumstances are such that perhaps not this year. And I think I agree with you, Nate, from what I know of that committee, I can't imagine uh, coming in usefully uh, at this stage. It's really, yeah. we've, the ball has been, the, 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 what do you call the water is under a bridge here. Right. Okay. Uh, and then um, DRB, anything from you, Karen? Um. Well, we approved, there's going to be that bakery, Henian's is going to be now Buttercup. Um, and it's supposed to open on Friday. It'll be really interesting because it seems to be Chinese people baking <laughs> Buttercup. So we wish them luck. And that was approved. Um, then we approved some uh, uh, an outbuilding of a window uh, on a Jones building in Prey Street. Um, and I think 
the UMass store is going to open also pretty soon. Um, we sent them back to kind of reconsider their signage to just make the lettering a little bit smaller, but that's exciting. That's going to be opening too. So that's what we did. And we're basically working at revising our standards uh, and seeing how difficult it really is to uh, verbally express what it means that you have to be in kind of compatible with the neighborhood. These things are actually pretty subjective. And then to try to make that into a concrete standard, the more you think about it, the more incapable you are of really being able to define some things. So we're wrestling with that. All right. All right, thank you. Uh, I am not gonna offer any report of chair tonight. I, other than to have a, have a great Thanksgiving, everyone. Uh, Nate, anything on report of staff? I know you've been trying to hire people. Um, sure. No, I was gonna say two things quickly. The, um, I think I emailed the housing needs assessment to the planning board. And so we're, you know, we're going through the process of updating the housing production plan which the board will need to um, approve before we submit it to the state, which the plan won't be done until the spring. But I think, um, you know, in the next month, uh, if not in December, then early January, we can have the, you know, we can, you know, you can, we can have a, a discussion of the needs assessment. If you have any comments, send them to me and I can forward them on to the consultant. Um, and then in terms of the design review, uh, downtown design standards, you know, kind of to what Karen was saying, um, Dodson is holding a public meeting, a uh, big public meeting in, um, gosh, I'm blanking on the date, like uh, December 9th, I think, or so. Um, and so, you know, your members can be uh, encouraged to attend that. There will be another online survey for streetscapes. Uh, they had done buildings, but now it'll be streetscape. And, you know, Dodson's working through, you know, with a working group, and they've come up with kind of a vision statement and a number of um, descriptors of downtown and they're and it's really nice, right? Like you do want to be, um, you know, vibrant and uh, you know, community and you know, and so they have, you know, they they're really trying to start and have a nice vision and and all these things. And I agree with Karen that so within that they have say like nicely designed, right? Say for instance, but then what does that mean? And it means different things to different people. So they're really trying to kind of come up with some consensus around key key ideas and then move toward. You know how how does that then get translated into these design standards and so they're working through that um so you know you can always check the town calendar there's going to be a few things happening in december for that uh and then lastly probably in the next two months too the town staff is working on the open space and rec plan and we had discussed it months ago but the planning board also has to uh, vote to adopt that before we or um maybe, I don't know, accept it or approve it, something along those lines before we send it to the state. And so that'll come probably in January to the board again um, to look at. All right, thank you. Jesse? Nate, what's the timeline for the housing needs uh, assessment? I haven't been getting comments. I, I have a few questions, but I want to read it more thoroughly. So how soon do you need those? Feedback. Oh, I, uh, I mean, you have a, you can, you know, if you have the next two or three weeks, so I don't, the, the consultants won't um, really be finalizing that until probably early January. They're having a public meeting on it uh, in December, but they're, they'll be willing to accept comments all the way into, you know, through December. But. All right. Anything else? All right. Thank you all for staying with us. Time is 9.54. And we are adjourned. Our next meeting is December 4th. And I guess, Nate, will we, should, can we start at 6.30 or should it be 6.45? Uh, no, 6.30. I think the first hearing is scheduled for 6.55, then 7.05. So, you know, we could take care of other business before the hearings, whether that's minutes or, you know, the other topics. And that way, when the hearings start, we can be, um, you know, we can go through those. Um, yeah. Okay. December 4th at 6.30. Happy Thanksgiving. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Happy Thanksgiving. Thanks, everyone. Bye.
Good night, Pam. Good night, giving.